The Know Your Cuckoo Foundation or KYC came about because we realized that there was a paucity and a lack of knowledge really about uh, cocoa in, in Ghana. When you look at it, we use just around 19% of the cocoa bean, so 81% of the cocoa tree is unutilized. So we thought that it was high time to be in a position to educate, to create events, to, to create the, the necessary platforms to develop cocoa knowledge and opportunities a lot further. The theme for this year's ACE event is Africa Beyond Beans. Currently, Ghana and the Ivory Coast together earn almost just less than $5 billion, whilst the chocolate industry alone, and not even factoring cosmetics, etc., the value is about $120 billion. And so we think that it's high time that we, we added value to our beans to get a lot more money out of what we grow and produce. GEPA is supporting ACCA because of mainly the support that it gives to cocoa and cocoa derivatives. We have been supporting so many other products and services and it is important that cocoa is also supported, everything that comes out of cocoa. And to do that, we need to showcase what we have. By working with GEPA, ACC is also basically aligning itself to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which we have all signed on to, and exposing itself to the wider market of Africa. So we think that it is in the right direction that we are working with ACC and other partners as well, as we are promoting all of these um, partners on the African market. My name is Efua Asabia Asari. It will please me immensely if you can be a part of the ACC, either as an exhibitor or as a spectator, or as a potential exporter or somebody who wants to know about the cocoa business. I'll be very pleased if you pass through. Thank you. The Know Your Cuckoo Foundation, or KYC, came about because we realized that there was a paucity and a lack of knowledge, really, about uh, cocoa in, in Ghana. When you look at it, we use just around 19% of the cocoa bean, so 81% of the cocoa tree is unutilized. So we thought that it was high time to be in a position to educate, to create events, to, to create the, the necessary platforms to develop cocoa knowledge and opportunities a lot further. The theme for this year's ACE event is Africa Beyond Beans. Currently, Ghana and the Ivory Coast together earn almost just less than $5 billion, whilst the chocolate industry alone, and not even factoring cosmetics, etc. The value is about $120 billion. And so we think that it's high time that we, we added value to our beans to get a lot more money out of what we grow and produce. GEPA is supporting ACCA because of mainly the support that it gives to cocoa and cocoa derivatives. We have been supporting so many other products and services and it is important that cocoa is also supported, everything that comes out of cocoa. And to do that, we need to showcase what we have. By working with GEPA, ACC is also basically aligning itself to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which we have all signed on to, and exposing itself to the wider market of Africa. So we think that it is in the right direction that we are working with ACC and other partners as well, as we are promoting all of these um, partners on the African market. My name is Efua Asabia Asari. It will please me immensely if you can be a part of the ACC, either as an exhibitor or as a spectator, 
or as a potential exporter or somebody who wants to know about the cocoa business. I'll be very pleased if you pass through. Thank you. The Know Your Cuckoo Foundation or KYC came about because we realized that there was a paucity and a lack of knowledge really about uh, cocoa in, in Ghana. When you look at it, we use just around 19% of the cocoa bean, so 81% of the cocoa tree is unutilized. So we thought that it was high time to be in a position to educate, to create events, to, to create the, the necessary platforms to develop cocoa knowledge and opportunities a lot further. The theme for this year's H event is Africa Beyond Beans. Currently, Ghana and the Ivory Coast together earn almost just less than $5 billion, whilst the chocolate industry alone, and not even factoring cosmetics, etc. The value is about $120 billion. And so we think that it's high time that we, we added value to our beans to get a lot more money out of what we grow and produce. GEPA is supporting ACCA because of mainly the support that it gives to cocoa and cocoa derivatives. We have been supporting so many other products and services and it is important that cocoa is also supported, everything that comes out of cocoa. And to do that, we need to showcase what we have. By working with GEPA, ACC is also basically aligning itself to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which we have all signed on to, and exposing itself to the wider market of Africa. So we think that it is in the right direction that we are working with ACC and other partners as well, as we are promoting all of these um, partners on the African market. My name is Efua Asabia Asari. It will please me immensely if you can be a part of the ACC, either as an exhibitor or as a spectator, or as a potential exporter or somebody who wants to know about the cocoa business. I'll be very pleased if you pass through. Thank you. The Know Your Cuckoo Foundation, or KYC, came about because we realized that there was a paucity and a lack of knowledge, really, about uh, cocoa in, in Ghana. When you look at it, we use just around 19% of the cocoa bean, so 81% of the cocoa tree is unutilized. So we thought that it was high time to be in a position to educate, to create events, to, to create the, the necessary platforms to develop cocoa knowledge and opportunities a lot further. The theme for this year's H event is Africa Beyond Beans. Currently, Ghana and the Ivory Coast together earn almost just less than $5 billion, whilst the chocolate industry alone, and not even factoring cosmetics, etc. The value is about $120 billion. And so we think that it's high time that we, we added value to our beans to get a lot more money out of what we grow and produce. GEPA is supporting ACCA because of mainly the support that it gives to cocoa and cocoa derivatives. We have been supporting so many other products and services and it is important that cocoa is also supported, everything that comes out of cocoa. And to do that, we need to showcase what we have. By working with GEPA, ACC is also basically aligning itself to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which we have all signed on to, and exposing itself to the wider market of Africa. So we think that it is in the right direction that we are working with ACC and other partners as well, as we are promoting all of these um, partners on the African market. 
My name is Efua Asabia Asari. It will please me immensely if you can be a part of the ACC, either as an exhibitor or as a spectator, or as a potential exporter or somebody who wants to know about the cocoa business. I'll be very pleased if you pass through. Thank you. The Know Your Cuckoo Foundation or KYC came about because we realized that there was a paucity and a lack of knowledge really about uh, cocoa in, in Ghana. When you look at it, we use just around 19% of the cocoa bean, so 81% of the cocoa tree is unutilized. So we thought that it was high time to be in a position to educate, to create events, to, to create the, the necessary platforms to develop cocoa knowledge and opportunities a lot further. The theme for this year's H event is Africa Beyond Beans. Currently, Ghana and the Ivory Coast together earn almost just less than $5 billion, whilst the chocolate industry alone, and not even factoring cosmetics, etc. The value is about $120 billion. And so we think that it's high time that we, we added value to our beans to get a lot more money out of what we grow and produce. GEPA is supporting ACCE because of mainly the support that it gives to cocoa and cocoa derivatives. We have been supporting so many other products and services and it is important that cocoa is also supported, everything that comes out of cocoa. And to do that, we need to showcase what we have. By working with GEPA, ACC is also basically aligning itself to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which we have all signed on to, and exposing itself to the wider market of Africa. So we think that it is in the right direction that we are working with ACC and other partners as well, as we are promoting all of these um, partners on the African market. My name is Efua Asabia Asari. It will please me immensely if you can be a part of the ACC, either as an exhibitor or as a spectator, or as a potential exporter or somebody who wants to know about the cocoa. Extend my heartfelt warm welcome to every one of you for joining us today for the opening ceremony of the Made in African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo, ACE for short. I say Akwaba to you all. The first African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo is aimed at showcasing and celebrating achievements and also bringing together industry leaders, emerging businesses, and chocolate lovers for knowledge sharing networking, sampling, and appreciating what we have. For this reason, we have selected the most appropriate theme, celebrating innovation, motivating consumption. As you may already be aware, the mandate of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority over the past 50 years has been to facilitate and promote Ghanaian exports through products, and market diversification. It is within this contest that we are partnering with the Know Your Cocoa Foundation to organize this maiden edition of the event. Our design now is to make the cocoa experience part of what you get when you come to Ghana. Any tourist who comes to Ghana, whether you come to see the castle or whatever you come for, this morning, uh, my, my ambition is to announce to everyone that we have launched Coco Agro Tours. So what can we do to ensure that our youth take up this Coco farm? First of all, we need to professionalize the sector and take away the poverty 
aura around it. And to do that, we need to show the business case of farming. Because the young people here, they belong to the Generation X. Everybody is WhatsApping, Instagramming and everything. They are not like our fathers and mothers. They want to see the business case in everything they do. They are a person who has a FA training who has a man who say, currently, we have a man who has a brain. We have a man who has a training who has a man 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 who free extension services. I think so, if I as a senior who can send in your dinner. Yeah, no, so Coco board my see is no more a demon, no more call a him for no name. Opinion leaders, no one send your bear on the mammo as I said, yeah, I hear more fool. And I think so, hybrid in our kind of Coco board, so send your own kind of sense is to be himself. So, who can speed ya? Yet to me, my hybrid in free. When you come to Ghana, uh, uh, customs and traditions don't allow women to get access to land. But today, uh, I can say that what I've listened to, uh, going back to my community, I can encourage my chiefs and elders to put measures in place for um, our fellow um, ladies or females to also have access to land. Because you can see that what men are doing, when we give the chance to women to do it, they tend to do it better than what the men are doing. And whenever you have a product that um, tells people that, hey, you can get 20 benefits from it, it sounds very much like somebody selling the new plant bars, you know. But at the point when I started reading about cocoa, I was like, no, this can't be true. It's, there are too many things. Cocoa is such that um, you would eat it and will not put on weight. That's the first thing you will have to note about cocoa because of the low calorie content. It also has proteins and has carbohydrates and has a high fiber content. You know, in addition has B vitamins and also has um, quite a number of um, what we call the micronutrients. You know, things that the body needs in very small quantities to enable it to function. So you realize that Ghana produce a lot of cocoa butter and this is exported. It goes out there, then they churn it and turn it into cosmetics and then bring it to us to buy at very expensive prices. So what do we do? We need to promote the local utilization of cocoa butter in Ghana. Like now we are promoting the local consumption of cocoa powder because of its health benefits. We shouldn't forget, whatever is in cocoa powder, we have some in the butter as well. When it comes to cocoa butter in a body lotion, there's a limit to the percentage you can put because you may have separation. Your oil will be sitting at the top. doesn't matter what emulsifiers you add and it is. So there's something in cocoa butter whereby chemically, we can have an ester formation from it. Polythanic glycol is a substance uh, that can be reacted with cocoa butter and then we suddenly have what we call PEG cocoa butter. With PEG cocoa butter, now it doesn't matter what you want to make, you can make your lotion, increase the percentage of cocoa butter, it is still cocoa butter. It has a thousand other benefits, even in the pharmaceutical industry. We have to start defining things based on our terms. I mean, we have to start calling stuff what we want and what suits us. Because we can't be sitting there and then dancing to somebody else's tune. We're tired of that. So, at this point in time, yeah, if it's 70% something and it's 10% this, we have to decide what we call it. So 57 is an artisanal bean to bar chocolate a manufacturing business here in Accra. We make chocolate from bean to bar. What's very unique about our chocolate is that we fuse it with Ghanaian art and culture. So you can see that some of our chocolate has the Adinkra symbols on them, which is very common and native to Ghana. And then equally, our packaging features various places or um, cultural aspects of Ghana as well. Okay, hi, I'm Jabongwaya Delia Carmen. I'm the co-founder and the quality manager of Scoop Shokotogo. 
So we are the first company in Togo to process cocoa beans in chocolate and other byproducts as chocolate spread, uh, hosted cocoa beans, uh, cocoa past and other products. So. Chocolate is a company that produces chocolates. And at the moment we have three flavors, main chocolate that we produce. That is the white, the milk and the dark. Yes, that's what we basically produce. And we produce from Ghana, pure Ghana cocoa. So we have met our competitors, we are sharing in order to just help produce more for Ghana, not for ourselves only, and not be like we are being selfish, I want to be alone, no, it doesn't work that way. If you say Ghana, we all belong to Ghana. And once I've seen my friends also being competitive, that mimics the work more, I'm a key. But with that competition, it will be like, oh, I'm alone, so let me do anything anyhow. So far, we are making contacts, meeting new people in and outside Ghana, so it's been a great experience. For um, opportunities, um, I would say we've met interested people who want to invest and also uh, people who would like to supply us with um, some raw materials. So we are looking at contacting them after the program and finding out if we can do some business together. We are very, very privileged to have an, an actual demonstration of how to make certain simple products from all sections or all aspects of the, the cocoa uh, tree from the leaf to the beans extra Um, well, being at the first African um, uh, cocoa and chocolate expo is, uh, is, is, is wonderful. Uh, I mean, this is the first, but I hope many more to come uh, because it's really a platform for different entrepreneurs, for people working in the sector um, to come together, share knowledge and experience. Uh, I just had a chat with, uh, with somebody here that uh, it's so important actually to uh, share knowledge and, and keep uh, you know, uh, ideas alive and, and, and share experiences because I think in sustainability, uh, is, which is my well, expertise and in the cocoa sector, uh, I think people can be a little bit, um, well, I wouldn't say depressed, but it's, it's, it's quite a long process and it's a lot of discussions about how to change and, and these actually uh, activities and these events bring different people together to have that discussion and keep having that discussion. My expectation has been met because I was coming here with the hope to see some new products made from cocoa, which I haven't seen before, and talk with the people who make them. I have seen them, I've talked with these people, so yes, I'm full. And then also discussion. There was an open, sincere discussion with the problems, challenges. So I'm happy, I'm satisfied fully. It is our expectation that the Expo will grow to become a truly African premier and dedicated show for the Cocoa Value Chain, which is able to rival all other Expos in its category globally.
Welcome to Thea. My name is Lana. I am uh, the co-owner of uh, this coffee house. Um, I uh, grew up in Ghana in the 80s and uh, this was uh, something that I always uh, hoped for, wished for, um, to open something that would showcase all that Ghana has to offer. I want to tell you a story which I think is something that will forever remain with me and especially in this industry. We partnered with a local cocoa farmer and it was a beautiful experience because we took people who had not ever been on a farm to a farm. And on the bus I was sitting next to them and they were having discussions, oh, my father has a farm, my grandfather, I inherited a farm, but I've never been because I'm not interested. I want to be in Accra. I want to be an architect. I want to fulfill my dreams. And when we got to the farm, and it's a beautiful farm, very well organized, very well guided. It was a guided tour. They were taken aback because for them, the dream was Accra, the city. When they went on the farm, they fell in love with it so much that they, they, on the way back, they were saying, I want to go visit my farm. And I think that's what you need. You need them to connect to their roots, to their heritage, to whatever they've inherited from their grandparents that they thought had no value. So in this sense, valuing what they have and taking it to another level is what I think, in my view, the theme of this conference means to me. Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth and final day of the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo 2021. It's been an amazing last couple of days exploring the cocoa industry and what advantages and progress it can make over the course of the years and also highlighting the issues that are, you know, challenging the industry, celebrating the achievements that have been had by all industry players. Indeed, it's been amazing. Your feedback has also been very encouraging. I'm glad that I was able to participate in this and I've learned a lot. Hopefully, you have learned a lot as well and connected with as many people as possible. We are still coming to you from Accra, the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo 2021. We are on with our panel sessions again today. Uh, we are looking at challenges and opportunities in marketing Sierra Leone specialty cocoa and chocolate. So welcome everyone to the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo 2021 from wherever you may be tuning in from today. I am Dr. Christy Leslie. I'm the education director of ACE this year, and I am hosting today our panel on Sierra Leone Cocoa, which is titled Challenges and opportunities of marketing Sierra Leone specialty cocoa and chocolate. And so we'll be dealing with um, various issues about sourcing cocoa from Sierra Leone, about trading it, about manufacturing it and marketing it. And we're particularly focused today on um, specialty markets. And so those are markets, they tend to be in Europe and North America at the current time where uh, the cocoa from Sierra Leone moves into what we might think of as a premium value chain, where the cocoa is marketed as chocolate um, that may be um, considered artisanal or craft chocolate, um, something under a premium umbrella. So our structure for the panel today, I'll be briefly introducing our panelists and just a, a word to our viewers. I have three of our four panelists here with me today and we will be hosting our fourth panelist um, separately. And so you will see a conversation today amongst three of our panelists and then the fourth one will 
obviously be edited into the panel at a later time. To you viewers, you will see all four together. But in this very moment, I'm talking with three of our panelists. So I will introduce them uh, briefly, and then I will turn the table to our panelists one by one, and they will talk to us for five to seven minutes about their work with Sierra Leone Coco, and um, they will be sharing with us something that's very exciting or interesting or motivating about working with Sierra Leone Coco, and then again, something that's very challenging. And then after each of our panelists have this, has a chance to speak, we'll move to a brief question and answer session. So really looking forward to sharing this time with our panelists today, and I will introduce them in the order that I will ask them to speak. So first up, we have Michael Cooley, who is an agroforestry, forestry and permaculture designer. He's also a lecturer, an educator, and an international agricultural development consultant. So he provides consulting to a number of organizations around the world who are working with development and of course, including Sierra Leone. So he'll be talking to us about that. Next, we have Marika von Sanford who has quite diverse experience working in the cocoa industry. She has previously been coordinator of the annual Chicoa conference in Amsterdam and uh, consults to companies on issues of cocoa and chocolate. She is the founder of uh, Pasha de Cacao, which makes juice from the cocoa pulp, and also of Gaia Cacao, which trades specialty cocoa beans. So she'll be talking to us about her work in um, with those businesses with Sierra Leone Coco today. And then we also have Greg D'Alessandra, who is the cocoa sorcerer for Dandelion Chocolate, which is a craft chocolate company based in San Francisco, California. And um, being cocoa sorcerer means that Greg travels to cocoa producing countries um, really around the world and establishes and maintains relationships with the cocoa producer organizations that um, Dandelion sources from and makes buying decisions around the cocoa that Dandelion will use in its craft chocolate bars. So really a big welcome to the three of you today. It's fantastic to be here um, talking with you and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about Sierra Leone and its specialty cocoa trade. So I'll turn it over to Michael and uh, Michael, you have the floor. Okay. Well, thank you, Christy, and thank you for the invitation to be involved today. Um, as you mentioned, I, um, I'm a consultant uh, for international development organizations focusing on agriculture. I run Narrow Passage Permaculture and Agroforestry, and I'm currently doing consulting for four development organizations. Um, I have a master's degree from the University of Missouri in agroforestry. And my vocational focus has been in tropical agricultural development. So my focus is coming from a development point of view, uh, not so much a marketing and product point of view. Uh, regarding cocoa in Sierra Leone, I'm happy to be working with the cocoa farmers in the Mandu chiefdom of, of uh, Eastern Sierra Leone, Southeastern Sierra Leone. And, we are restoring cocoa farming uh, that has, was abandoned during their civil war. Uh, we have over 50 farmers so far who are members of the association and the Mandu Cocoa Farmers Association provides training and uh, resources and uh, technical background and support to bring these cocoa farms back online. Uh, when the civil war was, of course, a lot of the farms were abandoned. Um, it was a long situation. And when the war was over, people were basically spending their time growing food to survive, uh, which meant cutting down forest and planting cassava usually, uh, which is a problem which I'm sure Bjorn will talk about as far as removing the rainforest uh, to do that. And, and so, the cocoa farms, which were there, uh, had just been overgrown and were completely uh, brushed in with, with weeds and other species. 
but the trees are, most of them are still viable and still productive. And so we're going in and teaching the people how to clean up the, uh, the cocoa farms, how to identify pruning and how to identify trees that need to be replaced. We've started nurseries to replace those trees and we're bringing the cocoa farms back online. And we have a model farm in the chiefdom in the town of Baima. And that model farm is where we bring farmers for training and education. They can see how things are once they're brushed and back online. Many of these farms are owned by the children of the original farmers because it's been so long and they may not have received the, the training passed down as it would have been if the farms were active. And so um, we're really happy to be able to bring them in, show them how to bring these farms back online and, um, and create a, a livelihood again from cocoa. Um, in addition to restoring the farms and, and producing more cocoa, which is a great thing in itself, the, um, the restoring of livelihoods is, is something that really has meant a lot to me. It's, it's, it's been a big factor in, in my motivation. Uh, the restoration of dignity that comes when you tell somebody, we have work for you, we're going to pay you to do something. If you will work, we will give you this money. If you can come and brush and they, they shake their heads. They say, how can this be? They're just, they're just so happy to have something to do that will give them an income. And because we have so many farms that have signed up to be involved with this, it's, it's affecting very many villages in this, in this chiefdom. And it's, it's really exciting. It's, it's uh, quite frankly, a huge part of my motivation in, in doing what I'm, I'm doing. Of course, as you mentioned to us before, in preparing for this, there are challenges. Um, the challenges that I see are uh, that have a, that have been most important to me, or the idea of navigating and accessing the the single origin market. Um, you know, the Mandu chiefdom is in the region of the Gola rainforest, but it doesn't wholly lie within the Gola rainforest. So if someone is trying to market a single origin chocolate cocoa from the Gola rainforest, technically not all of our chiefdom is in the Gola rainforest. Some of it is outside what would technically be recognized. So if it's a Sierra Leone cocoa bar, certainly, if it's a Gola Rainforest cocoa bar, will that be honest to say that all the cocoa came from the Gola Rainforest? So the, the idea of single origin, you know, if it's, I know that if you have uh, cocoa being brought in from another country and you're trying to sell it as cocoa from your country, is that, is that legitimate marketing? And so that's, that's one of the challenges that I see. Um, the, the Sierra Leone cocoa, it's, it's an excellent opportunity. I think the farmers that I'm working with are motivated to produce the highest quality cocoa that they can, they can produce. They, um, they're so excited. Um, perhaps their excitement is um, enhanced by the fact that these farms have been abandoned for so long. This is a newfound Thing to them, all of a sudden they have a an industry right before them that they haven't been doing anything with, and um, because of that excitement, they're they're very motivated to learn to produce the best quality. What do I have to do to have the perfect fermentation? What do I have to do to dry it so that I have the highest grade of cocoa when when it's sold? They're very motivated towards that, and so we're. We're confident that the Sierra Leone cocoa from the Mandu Chiefdom will be some of the best cocoa in the world. Um, they are motivated that way, and we're motivated and, and have a, a passion to help them to do that. They, um, 
they're they're excited about the emergence of Sierra Leone as a as a quality cocoa in general. Um, they have a they have a real sense of pride in this opportunity, and we're very excited to be helping them with it. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel today, and and uh, hope to be involved with with the other panelists more in the future. Michael, I want to, before I turn to Marika, I, I really want to thank you for those comments. And I, I want to draw our, um, our audience, our viewers attention to two things that you said, because I think they're really important for um, those of you participating um, who may be newer to the chocolate industry or who may be familiar more with the Ghana context, but Two things stand out for me from what you said, Michael. One is that the way the specialty market is structured in the US and Europe and in other um, parts of the world is really, as you say, focused on single origin bars. And of course, that's not exclusive. There's other ways to, to market cocoa as specialty product, but single origin is a really popular one where the cocoa just comes from one country. But as you point out, and something that really just enlightened me is that the, 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 the cocoa market itself may not be structured in that exact way, that there may be other aspects of the cocoa industry itself that don't necessarily lend itself, um, lend themselves to uh, a single origin marketing strategy. Um, and the fact that the cocoa may move around into different parts of Sierra Leone or across borders is one of them. There's also um, various other reasons why marketing a single origin bar might be challenging, but I really thank you for that, for that comment. Um, I've already learned from that. The other thing I just wanna briefly point out is that um, many of our, our, our viewers today may be um, familiar with the Ghana context and here they're really, is not that generational gap in the knowledge that you know the cocoa farming skills have you know been in many families for many generations, and it's very it's very emotional to hear you speak for me to hear you speak about the fact that there there may be those generation gaps because of um, because of conflict because of um, people not being able to maintain their farms uh, in a continuous way. So, um, that's something that we're not typically familiar with here in Ghana. So really, thank you so much for raising our attention to those really important issues. You're welcome. Thanks. I will, I will turn our, our, the floor to Marika now, who will talk to us about her work with Sierra Leone Coco, and hopefully we will hear about the trading side. So thank you, Marika. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, for inviting me. It is a lovely panel. Um, so my name is Marika and I uh, am based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I have a company called um, Gaia Cacao um, and we are specialized in uh, cacao beans. Um, we started off, well actually the start was a couple of years ago as you mentioned i was one of the organizers of shokoa which is a a large event and that didn't start large it was actually it was a very small event for consumers to talk to them about specialty chocolates and about you know how one chocolate tastes very different than the other um i was involved from the beginning of that um in 2014 i think that was uh and i uh, coordinated that event a couple of years as it grew bigger and bigger and that's already a nice sign that actually the the, the whole sector is, has been growing also uh, for specialty chocolate and cacao and so um, what I learned there um, there were a lot of producers of really good cacao beans uh, and they would then meet somebody uh, like Greg uh, who would say you know I'm interested to buy your beans but I would only buy 500 kilos or uh, one ton. Uh, then that would be an issue for that chocolate maker, for that producer, because you know how are you going to get one ton to to Europe or to the US? It's very costly. Um, so I noticed that although these these you know two ends of the sector basically came together on this event, that it was difficult for them to maintain or really build a business relationship from. Yeah, from what they were both needed uh, needing, which was this good uh, beans. So um, I was thinking, like, how can I, you know, support that? How can I play a role in it? And then in 2019, I sat down with my good friend uh, Mariana, who's uh, equally engaged in in cocoa beans as I am, 
Um, and we were thinking like, okay, well, we are in this spot here in Amsterdam, which is a very strategic, a good logistic place to be in for cocoa beans. Um, there's a big industry here. Um, all kinds of sustainability initiatives are happening here. There's Jokoa, of course. So there's so many, so many places coming together in this small city, Amsterdam. Um, so we thought, okay, maybe we can play a role there. We, we can support this kind of, um, in, in logistics actually, to support the producer of these fine good beans and the chocolate maker to, to be able to, to do business together. And uh, so from Chocoa, we started to engage more on the producer side and we started to select different uh, cooperatives uh, that we wanted to work with, different cocoa beans that we really liked. So we started to first to work in South America, mainly in Venezuela uh, and in Ecuador. Uh, and then later on, there was also Guatemala and some Nicaragua. And recently, we started to work with beans from Sierra Leona. That's also new for us, but uh, it's a very nice, uh, nice experience, I have to say, and I'll come on to that later on. Um, so, yeah, that's what we do. We, we bring those people together um, all around um, specialty cocoa. And also we realize that this market is not really big enough. Uh, so we also maybe shouldn't only work with specialty chocolate makers, but also with the bigger industry and support them to uh, buy good cocoa beans, sustainable cocoa beans, traceable cocoa beans from a good quality, and we can support in that. So we also started to supply and sell to the bigger industry. Um, so we have a, quite a, a big portfolio of specialty uh, chocolate makers who buy the beans via us, but also larger industry who wants to buy a smaller portion of Venezuelan beans to add it to their blend, maybe, but still this, these volumes are quite substantial. So that's how over the years we started to grow our portfolio of beans. And besides of that, of the beans, we also are engaged in um, consultancy projects. Uh, both me and my partner, Mariana, we are consultants. We have been consultants for the past years. Mariana is a bit more in the technical part uh, of chocolate. Like she, she used to work for Nestle uh, on the confectionery part. And she was like one of the uh, like food scientists designing the wafers in the Kit Kat. Uh, so very, very specific. Um, and we met at Chocoa and we became friends and started to work together. And me, I have a bit of a more um, uh, background in development work and human rights. I studied uh, international law and human rights in the Netherlands. And after that, I moved a couple of years to work in Cameroon. Also did some work in Nigeria and in Rwanda. But it was Cameroon where I really started to focus on cocoa beans. Um, so yeah, this consultancy work we have been doing and um, we have a very interesting project going on right now, which is uh, for USDA, um, for, the, for the government. And it is about a, uh, it's a global market study, basically. Um, and they reached out to us to, to see if we can do this uh, project. Um, and I was thinking, well, there's already so much information available on cocoa and chocolate. Like, what can we really add to that? But then when I started to dig a bit deeper, I realized that there's a lot of gaps in information. So, for example, the, the real interesting information is often not really shared publicly or not shared for free. So you have to pay 5,000 euros to get a market study. Uh, or it doesn't include um, cocoa butter or cocoa powder and it's focusing only on beans or it's focusing only on Ivory Coast and Ghana and not on the other countries and not on Asia or South America. So there are still a lot of gaps and what we're doing is bringing that all together and that's going to be released in the report's going to be released in January it's going to be available for everybody and it's really going to put all the yeah all the dots together and showing all the opportunities that are in the market for everybody to make use of for a more inclusive industry so um, yeah so that's what we do with Gaia Cacao we do cocoa beans and we do consultancy work and uh, yeah, Sierra Leone is one of our latest uh, additions to that. And we have um, one container of beans here in the warehouse that we are selling. And for us, it's a, it's a huge opportunity to also like, promote this new origin. Like for a lot of chocolate makers, this is quite an unusual new kind of origin. 
Um, so we're getting feedback from the market and understanding also how to work with the beans uh, and how does it compare to South American beans, which is in general more known for uh, in the specialty market. Um, so we're learning a lot over there. We're also seeing the power of storytelling, the power of marketing. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the unique um, parts of these cocoa beans are is, is the incredible story behind the Goda rainforest and how can we promote that and how can we show that it's so important uh, to yeah to share the the stories because a lot of people a lot of consumers also don't really know about the environmental impact of cocoa farming or deforestation like the focus is very much on the social economic aspects of cocoa farming and not at all actually uh, on the environmental impact and deforestation. So it's very important for us to promote this and, and see where it lands and see what we can do, um, see how we can sell it. That's basically, it's also a big an experiment for us to see how it moves. That was a bit of a long introduction, right? <laughs> and that was only Gaia Cacao. <laughs> yeah. Shall I also say something about Pacha de Cacao? Yeah, please do. I think that will be really interesting for people. Very short, very short. Yeah. yeah. So I also have another company and that is a juice company. So it's completely different. Uh, but the juice is made from the pulp around the beans of the cocoa. Uh, as you know, it's a fruit and it grows uh, on trees. And we're only using the beans, which is around 20, sometimes 30% of that fruit. And everything else, we're kind of leaving it unused or minimally used uh, and not really fully, um, yeah, not, the potential is so much bigger than what we're doing right now, what the industry is doing. So since I'm very much involved in creating impact and measuring impact and what can we do to improve uh, income of farmers, um, since 2017, I've been looking for ways to use the other uh, 80 or 70 percent of the cocoa fruit which is the pulp and the peel um, and that resulted in a juice and the brand is called pacha de cacao it's a cacao juice and uh, it's funny because uh, nobody really knows cacao juice here in the netherlands and in most places actually even in the in the countries where cocoa grows people don't really know about this so it's um yeah it's a completely new new kind of product, uh, very exciting uh, to do this and to be able to yeah, create a, a higher value to farmers by buying this waste product in a way. So, yeah. Rika, thank you so much. And I, I want to thank you for, for talking about um, Pacha de Cacao because the theme of the conference is Africa Beyond Beans. And I think it's really exciting to hear about work that's being done beyond um, trading cocoa and, and making chocolate because we are really in a moment of innovation here in Africa. And I think it's really exciting to hear about other ways we can use cocoa very much in keeping with the theme of the conference. And I'm also grateful to you for, for pointing out um, another kind of uh, disconnect sometimes in the industry when we're talking about the specialty market, the volumes are quite small. And um, it's really, um, I think, here in, in, in Africa, the volumes of cocoa traded tend to be large and to have companies like Gaia Cacao working logistically to bridge that, um, that large scale production from perhaps small scale demand on the part of any one company uh, for, for example, Sierra Leone is, is really exciting. And I, and I know that many of our viewers today will be really interested to hear more about that, um, the way that work happens, because it's it's not easy. I know <laughs> logistics of cocoa, uh, really when it comes down to it, it's all logistics. So um, I, I really appreciate the work that you do and, and enabling um, origins like Sierra Leone to be able to access specialty markets. So thank you so much. So I'm going to pass the mic to Greg from Dandelion Chocolate, and we're looking forward to hearing from you, Greg, about your work with Sierra Leone. Thank you so much, Christy. And hi, Ghana. I mean, it's, it's better if we're all in person. When the, anyway, um, it's so great to be able to talk to all of you today. My name is Greg D'Alessander. Um, I, uh, as Christy mentioned, um, I am the sorcerer for um, Dandelion Chocolate. We are what I would, it's funny, it depends on the context. I would usually say we are a small chocolate maker 
But when you talk about the special or the craft chocolate space, we are a large chocolate maker. Um, we're 100 to 150 tons a year of chocolate production, which in the grand scheme of things is laughably small. But um, as Marika noted, and this is very true, when you talk about craft chocolate, that is considered very large. A lot of craft chocolate makers are in the one to 10 ton range. Um, and so, you know, where we're buying containers, a lot of other people are buying one or two tons. Um, but so, yeah, so we, um, we're a chocolate maker in San Francisco, California, as well as in Tokyo, Japan. We have, um, we have three factories currently, uh, all very small ones, clearly. Um, and uh, I work with uh, producers from currently 13 different countries. Uh, so this means um, everything we do is focused strictly on single origin chocolate. So we don't add inclusions. We, uh, we don't make milk chocolate. All of the chocolate we make is just two ingredients, cocoa beans and sugar. Um, and all of it is made from single origin. Um, I also thought it was, um, Michael's point was really interesting about like, what does single origin mean? Like, is, is that a country? Is that a specific um, pr producer? Is it a specific farm? Is it a specific region? Um, and it turns out among the producers we work with, we have kind of all of the above. Um, some of the people we work with, are uh, a single fermenter. Some of them are a single farm. Uh, some of them are a region, so um, an aggregation of multiple different co-ops together. Uh, so it sort of, you know, it, it, it varies depending on, um, depending on who we're working with. Um, part of our goal as a company is both to make really good tasting chocolate, but also to ensure that there is um, a connection grown between the customers that we have and the producers that we work with. Uh, we, um, we, we see the chocolate that we make as a, uh, as a collaboration between ourselves and the cocoa producers. We couldn't make chocolate without cocoa producers. Uh, and so this is why on our chocolate bars, um, we, uh, we talk about who is creating the cocoa, where it comes from, uh, we, um, wh where possible we name the specific uh, producer and so, you know, Cocoa Camille in Tanzania, who we work with, the bar says Cocoa Camille Tanzania. Uh, we want to make sure that our customers are um, understand where all the cocoa is coming from. Um, this, so in doing this, uh, about, oh, I want to say it was four years ago, five years ago, Christy. Uh, um, this is, it's, uh, Christy is, is actually our initial connection to Sierra Leone. Uh, she had noted that there was um, that she was working with a group there um, uh, around the Gola rainforest, and so um, for us, uh, and this has been mentioned before, but um, the storytelling part is 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 useful um, both to the consumers to help them sort of get a better idea of like what cocoa is and where it comes from, um, but also honestly to the cocoa producers themselves, because I think a lot of times as a producer you don't people don't necessarily recognize the story that they have to tell because to you it's just who you are to other people it can actually be very interesting and very fascinating because they don't live in ghana um i would say a lot of the people who we have sold sierra leone bars to didn't necessarily know where sierra leone was which i know is a sad thing to say but at the same time it's great that people would get this bar that says gola rainforest sierra leone and go and look up the Gola Rainforest in Sierra Leone. And so this is part of why it's so important to us to sort of bridge that connection because uh, I, I think the, the, the way, an, another part of um, what we're sort of focused on and interested in is making sure that uh, cocoa producers are paid appropriate and fair prices for the cocoa that they're producing. Now this is, as you imagine, a very tough challenge um, on a lot of different levels. Uh, but um, one of the one of the ways that, that that can happen is by the cocoa producers themselves creating a brand. And so I mentioned Cocoa Camille um, from Tanzania. Um, I think they now have a strong enough brand that a number of, of chocolate makers seek them out because they've heard of them. They their their bags of beans were shown on a Netflix show that um, you know uh, from a chocolate maker in Iceland, um, and they got contacted by a number of people. And so. The, the brands of these producers themselves become very important um, uh, to, to, to help people be able to sort of relate to it in the same way people relate to a variety um, in a bottle of wine where, 
you know, um, whether, uh, whether it's a variety of grape or the region it's from, people recognize um, these words on wine, uh, we are trying to encourage the same thing to happen in chocolate. People recognize the words Gola Rainforest Sierra Leone and will gravitate more towards bars from Gola Rainforest Sierra Leone. Um, uh, in terms of working with uh, Gola Rainforest, you know, I, I think uh, um, it's all cocoa um, value chains have challenges. And I think um, one of the challenges um, for us has been that um, for the Gola Rainforest, uh, the container that we bought was the very first container exported. Um, uh, and so that was, um, that, that can always be a slight challenge. Um, but I think, you know, one of the other things that also is important for everyone um, uh, viewing to keep in mind is that uh, while, while you, you can command a much better price to the specialty market, um, the specialty market also requires higher quality in terms of both the fermentation and drying, also the sorting and these kinds of things. And so uh, one of the things that has to happen is to ensure that um, you're ready for that additional work of you know, making sure that the sort on the beans is better. Um, most people are doing it by hand instead of by machine for the specialty market. And these kinds of things, which, um, which while, uh, it's, while the money is absolutely worth it, it still is, is a lot more work to do. And that's one of the things that I think with um, Gola Rainforest, uh, there's been a sort of a, a back and forth to figure out what's the uh, appropriate amount of work to be done on the beans before they get to uh, the chocolate maker. Uh, thank you for having me, Christy. Really excited to be here. It's 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 such a pleasure always, Greg, to to listen to you talk about um, the way that a dandelion works in the in the craft space. Because as you pointed out, um, you know, there's so much education involved that I think we don't always realize as 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 consumers or even as people who work in the industry and i think um you know as 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 many of our viewers will know if you you know think about africa and cocoa at all you're usually thinking about ghana and ivory coast you know the top two producers in the world and something as you as you so beautifully described greg like putting the word sierra leone on a chocolate bar can already spark this learning journey for someone who like you say might not even know how to locate sierra leone on a map but then has this really exciting reason to go on this educational journey and find out more and hopefully feel you know some kind of connection to this place that you know you know all of us speaking on 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 this panel today we've all been to sierra leone we've all spent time there that's not an option for for many people um and and to be able to give them that connection through a, a chocolate bar is um, an experience that they, they may not have another parallel to. Um, so I want to just move to the Q and A and um, I want to pose a question and, and summarize a little bit, um, maybe what some viewers are also thinking about watching this panel right now, which is that we're talking about Sierra Leone and yet we're, I'm talking with three companies that are not based in Sierra Leone um, with, with, you know, representatives of companies or organizations who are also not based full time in Sierra Leone. Now, in a way that makes sense, because we are focusing on the specialty market in this particular panel, and the specialty market is well developed for cocoa and chocolate in North America and in Europe, which is where all of our panelists are speaking from today. So in a way that that is understandable, at the same time, I think we all may be wondering, what would it take to get to a point, say, you know, in the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo 2025, when we're offering a panel on Sierra Leone, what would it take for, you know, majority or all of the panelists to be speaking about specialty cocoa and chocolate from Sierra Leone itself? And so um, I want to pose that question to our panelists and hear their thoughts. Greg, I know you have a time, um, you have a, a schedule commitment coming up in a few moments. So I want to just offer you the opportunity to respond first. But if you if you don't have the time to do it, then um, we'll 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 wave goodbye to your Zoom square. But I'll leave it to you if you'd like to respond first. Thank you so much, Christy, and I I really appreciate. It. I think it's a very good question. I think it's um very topical of you know how and why can more chocolate be made. So from my perspective as a chocolate maker you know, how, how can more chocolate be made in the places that are growing cocoa? Um, and I think to some degree, I, I, I would love for more chocolate to be made in the places um, that are growing cocoa. One of the things that we've seen specifically in, um, in craft chocolate, and just give everybody um, a, a sense, our Sierra Leone um, chocolate bar, we sell for $10 a bar in San Francisco and in Tokyo, which is a lot of money. Now, 
a lot of that money is because we're paying employees in San Francisco and Tokyo, which are very expensive cities, to make the chocolate there, et cetera. Um, but I think one of the one of the things we've been seeing in craft chocolate is that the way a lot of the the sort of makers are existing is by selling to their local community. So as opposed to sort of you know Marses or or you know Calibos of the world who are selling to markets everywhere, gas stations everywhere. Um, you know, the, the, in, the, in the craft market, who you're selling to is direct to consumer and often direct to consumer in your, in your own community. So the question then becomes, how big is the chocolate market in some of the countries where cocoa is grown? And the answer to some of them, Brazil has a massive tree to bar market going on right now. And I think is, some, is, is definitely a country to look towards to say, hey, a lot of people have made a, a really good go of it. They're selling, you know, they have shops in Sao Paulo, um, in Rio that, you know, they're selling in the larger cities to the sort of more affluent consumers who are able to afford higher priced bars. Um, and so I think that to me is one of the questions of uh, like, it would be great to get chocolate made. The question is, who are you going to be selling that chocolate to? Because selling it wholesale outside of the country can get, can get very expensive. And so, the question is, who's your consumer base? Um, and like, that's a question I think would be really um, interesting to look into to, to figure out because I, I would love to see more chocolate be made in country. Um, I'd love, you know, I've, I've tasted bars made in Ghana and it's been very exciting to, to <laughs> taste bars made in Ghana. Um, you know, especially I think if you look at um, countries like uh, Vietnam, Maru, is a chocolate maker in Vietnam that did an amazing job of creating brands, not just around Vietnam as a cocoa producer, but the individual areas in Vietnam, uh, Ben Tre, you know, uh, uh, the, like um, the Doc Lok, like, like they basically, they were able to brand areas of their country that nobody had ever heard of because they were a chocolate maker in that country, knew everything well, were able to source sort of the best beans from those areas. And so I think that model can work. Um, it's just a question of finding your, uh, finding your customer. And with that, I unfortunately do need to pop my little square away. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I um, uh, Feel free to share my contact information if people are interested in getting in touch. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Bye, Greg. Thank you. thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you. We'll see you again soon. Uh, I want to point out for our viewers that, um, you know, one of the issues that comes up a lot in, um, again, that's maybe undiscussed or under discussed is the producing for the specialty market in a way, a similar way it was, we were talking about logistics um, before with, with Marika is that the cost of producing at a small scale, which most specialty makers are at a small scale, the cost of producing chocolate is much higher when you're working at a small scale than at a larger scale, for example, the Nestle and Mars and, and Barry Calibots of the, of the world. And so, you know, the price points of the bars are, reflect that. They reflect the higher cost of producing at a small scale. And so to translate what Greg was saying, you know, into a, the Ghana context, for example, to sell a, a $10 chocolate bar here, that's like selling a chocolate bar for, you know, somewhere between 55 and 60 CDs, which is not a price point that we see in the Ghana market. And so to, to just um, add to, to what Greg was saying, it's really important to remember about developing markets, you know, where the cocoa is grown, how do you develop the business plan in such a way that keeps the business viable, but that also, you know, reflects the market capacity and the price points that you can sell your bars at, at the volumes you would need to sell um, to, to keep the business, to keep the business thriving. So I'll, I'll turn the, the floor to um, Marika or, or Michael, would you like to comment on the question um, about what would it take to have Sierra Leone uh, companies represented on a specialty panel in, in two or three years time? Yeah, I would like to think about that. And it also reminds me of when I was living in Cameroon and uh, I was living in, Smida, in a small town on a mountain uh, quite far away from the bigger city. Sometimes I was craving for chocolate and I couldn't find it anywhere. and I would have to travel to Douala which was about an hour and a half away from where I was living to 
get a couple of Mars bars for, I don't know, two euro 50 or three euros, which is a lot of money, right? For a Mars bar, that's even more than what you would pay here in the Netherlands. So, uh, but I remember doing that uh, because I couldn't get it. Like I couldn't get any like, decent kind of chocolate, uh, not that it's really good, but uh, nearby. So I, I hope that that has changed in Cameroon, but I'm not really sure about it. But I think Greg is really, uh, um, I totally agree with him. Like, yes, it's possible. Like the production of, make, of, of chocolate, like chocolate making in itself is completely uh, doable. You need a couple of machines, of course. You need the beans, which are close already. Uh, so that's not really the issue. There's, there are some challenges, but it mainly comes to how do you grow the, um, the demand for, for chocolate? And it's not really um, known. It's not really, um, yeah. The, most Africans are not really big chocolate eaters, from what I know. So it's, it's really something that really has to grow. And that's not only in Africa, that's also in South America. For example, in Ecuador, where there's quite a lot of uh, tree-to-bar chocolate makers. So they, they are chocolate makers from Ecuador in South America. They work with the beans from Ecuador. And yeah, the, first of all, they try to sell it in Europe and in the US. And it's difficult, it's expensive, because you also pay a lot of uh, tax when you export a final product into these markets. So I know some chocolate makers who are now turning into their own markets to see how they can sell this premium chocolate into their own market. And that, um, yeah, there's definitely opportunities there, but there's also a lot of education that goes into it. Uh, you really have to, yeah, promote this also, and, and governments can play a role in that, and companies like, and, and people like what you do, Christy, can really help with that. Um, there are now some events happening in Ecuador that are really focusing on um, growing the consciousness of consumers for Ecuadorian chocolate. Um, which is worldwide known for good cocoa beans, but Ecuadorians don't really buy Ecuadorian made chocolate. So, but that's really, it's growing slowly by slowly. So my point is it's, it's possible, um, but we need to look at the, the, the demand for it and growing the demand. And maybe that starts a bit higher in the premium market. And then from there on becomes more accessible. Uh, events like what we're doing at Chocoa, you know, that really can help and, and, I know that the team of Choco has been looking at, um, can we do something like this in, in other markets in, that are not so known? It never really came off the ground, but I mean, why not? You know, if the will is there, we, let's, let's do it. Let's go to the market. It's, it's such a great point, Maria. And I think even the event we're at right now, the you know, African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo is an example of that. Um, you know, yeah. because we do need to raise the the conversation about consumer culture, because I do think there is this kind of divide between, you know, the cocoa is so well known in West Africa, including, you know, Michael was talking before about how maybe there's generational gap in knowledge and, and expertise and even farm ownership, but at the same time, cocoa is still is something known, you know, it's something that people would understand and deal with, um, given the extent of agriculture, of, you know, across across West Africa. But chocolate is not, you know, chocolate. OK, everybody knows what it is. It's not, you know, people are aware of chocolate and, and have probably tasted it at some point. But is it a big part of consumer culture? Not yet. You know, and that's a, a reality that I think we need to face into. When thinking about how to develop, you know, specialty opportunities in Sierra Leone and, and beyond in Africa. So thank you so much, Marika. Thank you. Michael, I will, we will go, we will return to you, our first speaker on the panel and, um, and ask for your comments on that, on that very question. Yeah. When, when I think about uh, what was said as far as the idea of producing the chocolate and then uh, it being important to have a local market. Um, when I think of Sierra Leone and when I think of them producing their own chocolate for export, I can under I can see that. I was in a grocery store in Freetown and I saw a box of Moringa tea and it was being produced in Sierra Leone for Sierra Leone market. And so I I don't know what the market is for Moringa tea there, but there is apparently enough that it's being produced commercially. 
it was in a nice package. It had it was wrapped. Everything was pretty much Western style product. But when I think of chocolate in Sierra Leone, um, Christy, you've been there. It doesn't matter what time of year you're there. It's 80 to 90 degrees or more. So the market for cocoa powder may be there, but the but the market for a chocolate bar, it, it liquefies. It's it's just not plus the idea of someone spending a hundred thousand leones for a chocolate bar, which is what, about what it would be, is it's not you're not able to fathom it. It's the fifth, it's one of the lowest on the human development index. It's a, it's not a country where you're going to have people spend a $10 US on a, on a cocoa bar to an, to an extent where it would be profitable. Um, in, in, in my, in my observation. And, and the main reason there's not a demand is that it's liquid. It's liquid at, you know, you don't, you're not going to have a bar. You're going to have a, uh, it's going to be liquid. And so that, that of course presents a problem anywhere in the tropics. Um, because traditionally when we think of the cocoa market, we think of chocolate. And when we think of chocolate, we think of processed chocolate that melts above 80 degrees or so. So that's that's part of the I think that's part of the answer. But as far as having it produced in Sierra Leone for export, I I'm I'm with Marika. I think hey, somebody could do it. They could do it tomorrow. They could set up a shop and start producing it. If they could find buyers for it, they could do it just as easily as as Dandelion or anyone else. So that that's kind of my observation. The heat is a factor. Yeah. You know, yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a factor, I think, across, across most African contexts, for sure. Um, you know, um, but I, I want to, I just want to first thank you for translating the price point that Greg talked about for a dandelion bar into the Sierra Leone context. I think you said, Michael, it would have been 100,000 leones. Did I get that? Did I remember that correctly? It's 10,000 leones sure. to the dollar. So a hundred thousand for a ten dollar chocolate bar is that math correct mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it's it really puts things into perspective thank uh, you know I, I i translated into cds here in ghana and i really want to thank you for giving us that that um that comparison you know just to put things in a local consumer price context for what you know a specialty chocolate bar of the kind that dandelion produces would would go for in sierra leone I also wanted to say that I, you know, the the lack of the cold chain and the the logistics of retailing chocolate, it's it, you know, you really got right to the heart of the matter as far as logistics, but um, and it, it's really a challenge. Um, it's a challenge here in Ghana as well. You know, I'm sure it's a challenge across you know other African contexts. But at the same time, I found a lot of what you said really motivating um, because you pointed out that there are markets for, for example, cocoa powder. And as Rika was talking about before, you know, her, her company Pacha de Cacao producing juice from the cocoa. And so I think that one of the things that I would love for, you know, our audience to take away from this panel is that, you know, specialty doesn't have to mean just chocolate bars and that specialty can be other kinds of products that would be, you know, more amenable to local retail and to the, the, the supply chains that do exist here. Um, and, and maybe even more in tune with consumer culture in Sierra Leone, in, you know, in Liberia, in Ghana, in Ivory Coast. And so I find that really exciting. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Michael, because it, gave, it left me with a feeling of motivation and inspiration. So um, I really, I, I, I will close our, 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 our discussion with um, our three panelists today here. And again, we will have a fourth panelist who will join us at another time and you will um, be hearing from them in our in our panel as well. But I want to thank the three of you who are here with me today so much. Um, just really grateful for your time and your thoughtfulness and and really all of the work that you are doing in in Sierra Leone and beyond um, in this industry to you know to to elevate and to um, support and to help businesses thrive. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chrissy. It was great being here.
Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, take care. And to our viewers, um, stay tuned for our, 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 next, our next program. Up next, we're having the next panel discussion. We're looking at charting the course of Liberia's Google future. So if you missed the other panel sessions from previous, please don't. Do stay on and make sure that you catch this one. They're very interesting and um, enlightening indeed. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo 2021. It is really my pleasure to introduce this next panel, um, charting the course of Liberia's cocoa future. We at ACCE are really, really grateful um, for our moderator and participants on this upcoming panel who are all joining us from Liberia. We haven't had a panel um, discussion on Liberian cocoa and cocoa value addition or chocolate before at ACE. And so this is a really wonderful opportunity to hear um, from our professionals, you know, just right next door practically and find out what's happening in cocoa and chocolate uh, so close by. So I will love to welcome Amelia Duggan, who is project manager Africa for Grow Liberia. And Amelia will be moderating this panel um, and I will turn it over to her now. And thank you so much, Amelia, for being here with us. Thank you to all the panelists and we're really looking forward to learning from you um, about what's going on in Liberia when it comes to cocoa and chocolate. Great, thank you so much, Christy. Yeah, just to uh, reiterate, I'm Amelia Duggan. Um, I work on Grow Liberia, uh, which is a private sector development program uh, supporting agricultural market systems in Liberia. Um, we're funded by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency and implemented by Adam Smith International. Um, so as Christy said, today's panel title is Charting the Course of Liberia's Cocoa Future. Um, the discussion today is going to be focused on value addition in particular. Um, and, you know, following the theme of the overall ACCE, each of our panelists is a cocopreneur in their own right um, and are, you know, using different ways, different approaches to add value to the cocoa and chocolate sector in Liberia um, and, uh, and internationally. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, the first uh, person I'll introduce is Lou Tolbert. Hello, Lou. Um, Lou is the founder and CEO of Liberia Cocoa Corporation, um, which is Liberia's largest active commercial farm and one of the country's first movers towards organic certification. Um, this year, Lou has focused on developing fully centralized processing capacity and establishing an outgrower network to target the production of high quality traceable and in 2022, certified organic cocoa. Hello, Lou. Um, so the next panel. Hello. Hi. Um, next up, we have Charles Tellier, who is the founder and CEO of Sobe Green. Um, and in the cocoa world, uh, we call them Sobe Cocoa. Um, they are a West African company operating in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and of course, Liberia. Um, Sobe Green started its operations in Liberia last year and is using its unique process to target the production of fine flavor cocoa um, and improve the livelihoods of Liberian farmers and is as well as uh, going for organic certification. You'll have to update me on the timeline, but within the next year as well. Um, we also have Joshua Zima on the line, who is co-founder, co-owner and production manager of Redemir Chocolate the first bean to bar chocolate in Liberia. Uh, they use Liberia grown cocoa and produces a wide range of chocolate products, including 70% dark chocolate bars, cocoa powder, baking chocolate, as well as cocoa tea, um, which the company sells at outlets in Monrovia and Ganta. Now, just in time, Rachel, you're back online. Wonderful. 
Um, our last panelist here is Rachel Mulba. She's been having some network issues, but I'm glad we're able to, uh, to connect with you. So Rachel is the founder and CEO of Monlay Enterprises, a company that she started from her front porch more than 20 years ago. Um, and under Rachel's hand, uh, Monlay has grown to become Liberia's largest cocoa trader with a network of roughly 4,000. <coughs> um, so Monlay has traditionally traded in conventional cocoa and this year is expanding the business to include a line of high quality traceable cocoa. Um, so welcome panelists. <laughs> to just quickly go over the structure of today's panel, it's going to be about 45 minutes total. Um, to start, we're going to hear from each one of our mm -hmm. panelists, um, and then we'll move into a Q&A session. So because of our time constraint, I will just, uh, I'll give you about seven minutes each to introduce yourselves, uh, your businesses, challenges that you face in the Liberian cocoa and chocolate markets, um, and the vision for your future. Um, and then the Q&A session will be about 15 minutes. Um, I will let you all know when you have about a minute remaining, um, and then we'll move on to the next section. So uh, let's go ahead. Rachel, since we have you on the line, let's start with you um, giving an introduction to yourself, to Monlay, your challenges, your vision. I'll hand it over to you. Oh, maybe not. We'll have to come back to Rachel, I think. Um, so then let's go back uh, to Lou. How about, let's hear a little bit about LCC. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, Library was 2009. Um, so we've been just over 11 years um, in business now. Um, the company's focus is plantation-style cocoa plantation. And uh, in addition to that, we have um, outgrowers where we work with smallholder farmers that we provide inputs training to. And we're currently, um, as you mentioned in your intro, um, pursuing organic certification for them. Um, there are roughly 500 farmers in the uh, Northeast corridor of Liberia, which we would like to have um, organically certified by 2022 um, in time for harvest season. Um, the plantation itself is uh, around 70 hectares. Um, the LCC private plantation is about 70 hectares. And uh, we got our cocoa, um, the actual seeds for the formation of this plantation from Ghana, from, from Craig. So right now we're in full production. Um, we net probably around 35 tons a year uh, from our private plantation, but this number is, is gonna be eclipsed by our outgrowers um, because we're gonna put more time into them. So that's the company in a nutshell. Um, in terms of the challenges uh, cocoa we have in cocoa in Liberia, I would say uh, policy is probably number one of them. Uh, the policies in Liberia for cocoa are, are pretty loose, pretty lax. Um, we don't have a real structure about things. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ideas, uh, not always in agreement. Uh, going forward, but that's something I hope that over the next year or so that we will be able to help to try and put it back into order so um, things are more easier for the for those who work in the cocoa sector in Liberia. Um, another one is infrastructure. Um, no surprise, uh, the road networks are not great. Um, a lot of times uh, we have uh, areas where we are trying to get to, but we can't get to because it's just the rains and it, the roads deteriorate and it becomes impassable. So um, that's another challenge for a lot of people in Liberia, not just for the cocoa sector, but all sectors. It's, it's 
cross-cutting, health, education, everything. Um, and I would say the third one would be, the third challenge would be um, access to finance. Um, that's something that we have personally experienced in Liberia. Um, there are not many uh, commercial banks or banks that are willing to give um, agricultural loans because of the time involved with it. Um, um, they're usually much shorter, um, 12 to 18 months, with um, extremely, extremely high interest rates. So that doesn't really work for a cocoa farmer or uh, farming in general. Um, so a lot of the farm, a lot of that, the access to financing that we do get is usually comes from outside of the country. Um, in terms of where I think uh, our company will be in the next uh, five to six years, um, uh, we want to be a destination for high quality organic cocoa. Um, this is what we're working on. This is where we're putting our efforts towards. And uh, we think we'll be able to achieve this. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are also looking to add value to the cocoa by also uh, producing high grade, high quality uh, tree to bar chocolate because we have our own plantation. So we want to use those uh, beans that will be centrally processed uh, and then put that into our production line. And then we can sell that also on the uh, local market. So I think that's about, it wraps it up for, for LCC at this time. Wonderful, thanks so much, Lou. Um, Thank you. Next, we'll pass it on to Charles. Over to you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yes, all right, so about Sobi Green. So we are a, a West African company. We are in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Liberia, as you said before. And we work in um, promote sustainable supply chains in, uh, in West Africa, working uh, with uh, cocoa farmers, but also cashew, peanuts farmers, soya uh, beans farmers, and also beekeepers. Actually, the, the, the philosophy of the company is to, um, is to try to, to drive a change within the supply chains. Hence, actually, when we look at a bit the, 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 the world uh, production, 70% of the world production is coming from West Africa. But there is no single one uh, flavor, high flavor uh, or fine flavor origin. So we told ourselves, okay, we have 70% per, uh, percent of the world cocoa production coming from West Africa. Farmers are living under the poverty line. And the other side, we are missing something where we can really add value in promoting uh, one of the best cocoa in the world. So we decided to, to go to Liberia uh, for, for several, several parameters. The first one, actually, uh, Liberia is very small. That is one. And two, its, uh, it's neighbors, Ivory Coast and Ghana, are really producing a lot. So our uh, observation is that the, the more the, the volume is limited, uh, more it becomes rare, hence it can be expensive. However, it can be expensive if it's of good quality. And here we'll come to that aspect as a challenge. But to come back as, um, as our, uh, let's say, genetics as a company for Sobe Green, uh, so we are a French West African company, as French, uh, we like wine, as many uh, many people. And actually, in the wine, uh, we try to inspire ourselves to, to use the same methodology to produce one of the best wine in the world, as we have in France, uh, to make it for cocoa. What you need, you need to have actually a good climate. And Liberia has an excellent climate. It's very hot. It's humid. The landscape, uh, even though the deforestation path is increasing, you still have a lot of primary forest. Two, the soil type and terrain is very good. The type of variety we have, we have all forest terrors. We have also uh, some uh, uh, other varieties that are not as hybrid uh, as we can have. So we have a special taste. Then we have all the 
I would say the, the, the production post harvest uh, techniques and practices. And uh, the more it becomes typical for, for cocoa and for Liberia, the more it makes the flavor of cocoa from Liberia very special. So if I come back to, to the fact that Liberia is, is very limited, we have uh, three unique uh, parameters. One, we have a unique terrain within West Africa. Two, we have actually unique people. Uh, it's very important to also remember the dynamic of the country. And uh, we had a civil war, we had Ebola, and now we, we have people very committed to produce uh, high quality cocoa. However, the issue is a market. And actually, if for the same price, we can buy a bad quality or good cocoa, there is no incentives for farmers. But nonetheless, the farmers are really committed and uh, interested to, to produce a, a much better cocoa. And the last one is we invested a lot in know-how. So we brought actually chocolate makers uh, in order to help us to, to really work on our own uh, post-harvest uh, practice. Hence, actually, we created Sobi Coco. And the Sobi Coco brand is a way to, uh, to give a, a life to a, a new kind of cocoa in Liberia of high-quality cocoa. In terms of challenge, I would say that uh, um, we have two issues. One is Liberia is very known worldwide as a very bad country for cocoa. So it's difficult to change the image, the reputation. But we are, it's, it's taking time, but we have a very good feedbacks coming from our customers that they are re reordering, reordering because the cocoa is excellent. And then um, the second one, the second issue is uh, our challenge is uh, we are sw switching a bit the paradigm of producing cocoa from a, a mass production to a niche market, and the niche market comes with conditions, starting with the farmers. So we need to change uh, taking fresh beans instead of to take the dried beans, and also changing the habits and uh, practices from uh, the officers on ground to really teach the farmers, but also for them to really learn how to, pro to, to produce a fine flavor cocoa. Then um, maybe at the, at the Liberia level, I think, and I agree with Lou, uh, policy is very important. And definitely uh, a public policy will uh, guide. And, uh, and here, there is on the table two visions. Either we convert Liberia, a small country, with all the parameters to become a fine sugar cocoa country, uniquely, organic certified, with the best practice and a better revenue for the farmers. Or we try to tend to fight uh, the volume aspect, which is Ghana and Ivory Coast doing so far. Of course, you will understand my position. I'm not here to, to decide. Uh, on the contrary, I'm just lobbying and supporting the initiatives locally to really increase the reputation and uh, improve the reputation of Liberia, which will, at the end of the day, improve the, the, the increase of money incomes for, for the country. The last one, actually, the, the last question about uh, where Liberia will be in a few years, in three, five years. I have a wish and I have a think. I wish actually Liberia becomes in the next five years uh, one of the hot uh, topic for fine flavor. Unfortunately, realistically, I think it's going to take time for everybody to really, uh, I mean, learn how to, pro to, to produce. On the contrary, the good thing is that there is a dynamic trigger. And as there is a dynamic, we can see that by three, five years, Liberia is going to be on the map. Not as the best one, but on the map of one of the good origins, and maybe the best origin of uh, West Africa. That my, uh, Think and double wish. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. That's my wish. And I believe in that you guys can do it as well. <laughs> um, so now we will pass it on to Joshua. Joshua, are you there? <laughs> Your button's not working. The internet connection is unstable. It's not easy. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Joshua. Hi. There you go. 
Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Joshua Sima. I uh, work with Rademir Chocolate. I'm the co-founder and production manager for Rademir. Um, Rademir started from the food processing and preservation class at uh, the university here, um, Liberian the National Christian College. And we've been producing 70% dark chocolate. Um, I'm in this Alberta. Produce 70% dark chocolate. Buy the cocoa beans from a local farmer in Liberia. And we started a business with the aim of helping to upgrade or to help the local farmer to get a better price um, from their We we been around looking at the price that have been offered by the middle man, the middle buyer, and the exporter from the local farmer. And comparing it to the international market price, we feel that uh, okay, we pay a low price. And then we look at the cocoa bean going to the country, just uh, uh, raw bean, we feel that okay, if we are value to it, it will be um, more better. We should keep job into the country, provide job for youth and young people. Um, and we we'll also be able to help the cocoa farmer to taste uh, the finished product from their cocoa beans. So that's why we started writing your chocolate to provide job for students or uh, youth uh, to be able to depend on their self, to be self independent and also helping to pay a better price to the local farmer. Uh, since 2018, the business started, we've been producing 70% uh, dark chocolate, we produce chocolate chip, cocoa powder, um, trying to produce milk chocolate, white chocolate, and that of uh, chocolate peanut butter spray. Um, those are products that we're trying to put on the market right now. And they come to the challenges faced by business. Uh, me and me, all the other guys that spoke for us talk about those things. Mm, one is the high quality cocoa beans. It is very difficult to get a high quality cocoa bean um, to produce this 70% dark chocolate. I know that there has been many organizations and Jews in Liberia training local farmers to produce high quality cocoa bean, but they are not being able to produce that. They have the idea to produce it, but they are not doing it because of maybe low price. Uh, if you have a quality cocoa beans and low quality beans, they just pay the same price for it. So maybe they are not being able to pay to produce uh, the high quality beans because of that. Um, it is making it very difficult for us to get a high quality cocoa beans to produce 70% dark chocolate. And one problem is, is one challenge is um, the rule conditions to get the beans from the farmer to the production area. I mean, the cocoa can come at the beginning of the middle of the rainy season. So to go to from get the beans from them, transport it to the um, production area is very difficult. I uh, take you two, three days to get it to your production area, and but then it will rain on the beans and will get wet, and the bean will get spoiled on the highway. Um, things that you no. Know, uh, challenges that we are facing. And I mean, Luke talk about one major one, which is and everybody do what they think is right. And what they think is right. And that's been one of the major challenges that we are faced with. Um, looking to the future, we uh, wish or we hope that Rademir become one of the big drug uh, producing company in Liberia. Um, they have thereby provide job for many people from working with uh, dividends from training um, on producing high quality beans and helping to reduce the, um, the importation of the raw beans. We hope that librarian will look at producing uh, chocolate or uh, cocoa powder to export cocoa powder, which will provide job for more. Liberian, uh, and as well as putting money into the country's economy. So there where we look at in the future in the next five to six years, we hope to be right there, producing more chocolate bar, providing jobs for more people and working with more farmers, training them, educating them to be able to produce high quality cocoa beans. There where we are now. Great, thank you so much, Joshua. I know I'm doing my part every day to help your business grow. <laughs>
eating a lot of that chocolate. <laughs> um, now we have back on the line here, Rachel Malba. Hi, Rachel. Um, let's go to you to give a, a brief introduction of Monle and the challenges you're facing uh, aside from internet connectivity um, and your vision for Monle's uh, future and for the future of uh, the Liberian cocoa sector. Yeah. Mole Enterprise is an organic cocoa trading company based in Liberia. Mole Enterprise is held by women. We've been at the same 2001. And Mole Enterprise is in part in pharma because they're working along with pharma for all to be able to get a good price. On the market, Mother Enterprise is working, giving good agricultural practice for harvest. Mother Enterprise believes in traceability and working to work to enrich child labor because of that. We give zero bloom to women because children are very close to women to decrease at least child labor in Africa, in Liberia, especially. And Mole Enterprise believe in good agricultural factory. And Mole Enterprise is fighting to export good quality cocoa beans. That's why we are being honored to pay in Liberia. That's why government is not paying key attention to agriculture in this country. But in our own means, little farmer, we try to reach out there to farmer. We try to identify with farmer. Because Mole Enterprise is involved in farmer, farming. So we, we, we believe in gender equality and we have more ladies on board. Some women have been taking advantage. We don't want advantage because some of them, husband died during the war and the farm left with them. And to manage a Mole Enterprise, somehow brush the farmer farm so that they will be able to get who years on the farm to settle up. But we want a connection to export our cocoa bean with, uh, to tell our cocoa to premium and organic cocoa. Instead of conventional, everything to be conventional. This is our, this is Monet Inter And this is our dream. And this is why we're working forward. To. And this is my general officer. Okay. And this is my business. Mole Enterprise believe in traceability. We get record from our farmer. We don't just buy and just leave you because we find out our other buy and just dash the farmer the world. We have passion for farmer and we have passion for the, the goods we produce. And we have been working along with Growth Liberia. We have been working along with CBR to get our farmer online. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, great. So now we will move into the Q&A portion of, um, of the panel today. So Charles, I'll start with you. Several of the panelists have mentioned quality as a, as a key challenge to developing Liberia's uh, cocoa and chocolate sector. Um, this is particularly high stakes for Sobe Green, who's driving for fine flavor in particular. Um, so what are some of the ways that Sobe Green is working to overcome this challenge? That's all right. I, I think it's a, it's a very good question and it's our, our daily challenge. Um, but first, we brought the expertise from uh, outside Liberia in order to build our capacity internally. I think that it's very important to be ready to invest on, uh, on the quality procedures. I mean, it's, it's a fact, it's a new thing to produce fine flavor. So we need to learn from others and adapt it and adjust with the Liberian context. That is one. And two, locally on the ground with the field officers and farmers to make sure that we are doing trainings, monitoring, trainings, monitoring and control on a daily basis. As it's a small, uh, it's a, it's a small production uh, unit. So as an industry, you need to have procedures in place on a daily basis with a pH meter, the level of dryness and so on. 
uh, yeah, that's what I could say actually for 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 the quality aspect. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua. You come at it from a little bit of a different angle, um, taking it one step further in Liberia uh, to produce chocolate. So, how do you go about addressing the quality issue? That's good. I'm not really a quality expert, but I've been doing a lot of research um, on quality cocoa producing quality cocoa beans. I did my thesis uh, work in the university, trying to do the own farm processing of cocoa, meaning the fermentations to get a better quality bean. Um, that gave me an, enough uh, idea of how to do the fermentation. So I've been working with a couple of farmers, like over 50 farmers, um, to train them and educate them on how to do the on farm processing of the cocoa beans to get uh, quality beans. So um, that is the way we have been helping uh, farmers to have the quality of food. Uh, uh, aspect that is undercutting all of this or is uh, a, a guiding theme for all of us is this market trend that we see where there's more and more increasing demand for sustainable uh, coffee or not coffee, chocolate and uh, and cocoa on the international market. Um, and this is something a lot of uh, your businesses are responding to. So, Lou, can I ask you, uh, do we have? Yes, there you are. Um, Lou, how is LCC responding to this growing international demand on sustainable cocoa? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have seen a peaked interest in Liberian cocoa um, over the last year. Um, we've had companies such as Dan Hauer in, uh, in the Netherlands. We've had Barry Calibo uh, in Brussels, uh, even Zota Chocolate in Austria, who have all participated on calls with us um, to see whether or not they could buy quality, high quality the cocoa from Liberia. Um, that's just to name a few. There, there are many, many more. So I think the, the trend and the word is out on Liberia as a possible destination for quality cocoa beans. Um, now it is up to us to deliver on that uh, because uh, a lot of these companies will not be around forever. And it's, it's very, very important that this time that uh, we're able to produce the level of cocoa. It do doesn't have to be a huge volume, but it just has to be good um, uh, according to their specifications. Uh, grade one, um, Charles is working on the, uh, the fine flavor. That is great too, but it has to be consistently good quality cocoa. Um, so we've seen this and uh, we have sort of targeted our approach to post-harvest to meet this, this growing demand. So, you know, for, for example, uh, from when you actually harvest the cocoa to when you, the number of days you have it before breaking it, the, the fermentation process, we have adopted a, uh, a centralized fermentation process now, which we didn't used to do before, um, and uh, a very, very slow drying process, which we had to, uh, you know, put in some actual hardware uh, to make sure that we could accomplish all of that. But we've seen a, uh, a, a great difference in the quality of cocoa. Um, and we are actually testing the cocoa in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, there is a, a lab there to make sure that uh, we are meeting all the benchmarks uh, for the highest quality. And um, I just, you know, really uh, want to stress that others and there are, there are people who are doing it also. There are a lot of farmers who are doing this. So the trend will be for Liberia to produce uh, less quality, but high quality cocoa, because we cannot compete with Ghana and, uh, and, and Cote d'Ivoire. So um, if the country is known as a destination for high quality cocoa, um, good quality cocoa, organic cocoa, I think um, it will serve us well in the future.
Yeah, for sure. Uh, this is a big issue for you guys at So Be Green as well. Charles, do you want to comment uh, also on this, uh, this trend in the international market towards uh, a really exponential demand for sustainable production practices? Yes, actually, I mean, worldwide, there is a, a market uh, driving the demand of sustainable cocoa beans, and also the, the biggest chocolate makers have, uh, have shown the trend. The EU uh, regulation, the USA re regulation, everybody is going towards more sustainability. But you have sustainability and sustainability. So it depends, actually, on the philosophy of the, of the company, the definition, but at least and what, what actually I'm glad is that in a few months, we have seen many initiatives in Liberia. Everybody is committed to work to change the reputation of Liberia. And the first fact that we have companies going to Liberia to look at it and see and test suppliers, it means that it's changing. Now it's open on the table, the discussion of Liberia as an origin for chocolate makers. Before, it was not too much. So I think it's a, it's a great success. Wonderful. And... So one aspect of these demands is that, um, you know, these buyers, these consumers, they want to see that smallholder farmers are benefiting. Um, Rachel, I know that you at Monlay do a lot of work um, to ensure that the smallholder farmers you work with are, uh, are benefiting in terms of income and, and livelihood. Can you tell us a little bit about that work that you do? My internet is still. Oh, can you not hear me very well? Let's move. I'll just move over to Joshua and ask you. You know. Yeah. yeah yes. Uh, you are saying something about my internet, but I can get you now. Yeah. Come in. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how does Monlay's work um, uh, and vision for the future benefit of smallholder cocoa farmers? Um, or how does how does Monlay's work benefit smallholder cocoa farmers in terms of income and livelihood? Yeah, Monlay's work with small owner farmer with various farmers to improve the quality that the farmer will be able to set to export our cocoa to benefit what we labor for instead of remaining a conventional cocoa. Monlay's dream is to make the farmer to produce good qualities so that the farmer will not set all of the time are conventional. But if we, the farmer, have the opportunity, the dream, the company have the opportunity, and we know what the farmer go through, we'll be able to offer a better price to the farmer. But this, this is our dream, and we're working toward it. Somehow, somewhere, the fauna is not much, but we are gathering it around one another to improve the farmer life, to improve the, 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 the community, to help. Because of red cocoa beans, I will speak, they have a good taste. We don't use chemical, we have big beans, and we are continuing to offer conventional cocoa. So, One farmer to benefit, one mother to benefit, one farmer to benefit. Instead of selling on a press out of the town, farm money gives the women press in the pay or bike during the harvest. And mother help gives scarlet to some of their children. We are we don't have much, but because of the passion, mother is doing this. And uh the other that come in, they can see the potential of Mole. Other companies have come in, Mole have been since 2021, have been selling. One day, we are not have any debt with our exporter who are in Liberia. And anybody can go there to find out they know that Mole been hard working. Mole have been giving nearly 40% of cocoa, Liberia cocoa, as farmer in Liberia. Uh, of capturing more of the of the profits along the value chain is a big topic, not just in Liberia, but across West Africa and 
basically the entire world, I would say. Um, and part of that is this value addition through local processing. Um, that's something, Joshua, that you at Redemir are doing, um, producing chocolate domestically and for, for sale domestically as well. Um, across West Africa and in Liberia, consumption of chocolate remains low at the same time. So how, how does Redemir think about this um, and respond to it? Okay. Um, that is very, very true. Um, we Maybe right here in Liberia, we have most of our customers to be like uh, Liberian and outside of this country. Uh, but for the typical Liberian, we not really like uh, to do with to take the seventy percent dark chocolate. But it's something that we are in the line of. of uh, just letting um. As local, local made product of chocolate, I don't think it's one that they have to do because most of the ask what is the health benefit. But anyway, we have some health benefit. We just explain to people on the social media, you see, you know, what's, let me see, our program, Facebook, telling them about importing uh, chocolate. If we are part in uh, May in Liberia Fair, which we have many Liberians coming by and selling. We keep on talking about importing our chocolate, how it will help uh, support the economy of Liberia, helping the local farmers, providing job. I mean, all those things, that's, that's what we are just doing right now to get people attention to using chocolate and not just chocolate for cocoa product, like the cocoa powder, uh, the, the chocolate chip, how they can use it. Oh, you know, it's just what we are doing to draw people's attention to how to and uh, get them to know that chocolate is just good and it is can, it can be used for I mean, many things as they deserve. That is what uh, Radimir is doing right now to get people's attention to using chocolate in Liberia and outside of Liberia. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we just have a few minutes left here. Um, we know that our, our audience for this panel might not know a whole lot about Liberia and Liberian uh, cocoa and chocolate. So I'd like to just take a minute to go around the room um, and get each of our panelists to comment on, you know, what makes Liberian cocoa special and, and why should the international cocoa community be interested? Uh, in Liberian cocoa. Uh, so Lou, let's start with you. You gotta take yourself off mute, there you go. <laughs> Definitely, that's a great, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, absolutely, I keep forgetting that. Um, yeah, so um, Liberian cocoa is unique. Um, this, this is one of the countries um, that first, was getting a lot of traction in cocoa um, production back in the 60s and 70s, but had to stop because of the civil conflict, which started in 1980 and then progressed on, uh, ended in 2003. So um, Liberia has been a little bit late to uh, the cocoa world, if you, if you will, um, because of that. Um, but the trees in Liberia are unique trees. Um, the fine flavor does exist here. Um, I have sampled some myself. Um, this is unlike the hybrid seeds that you get in Cote d'Ivoire and um, Ivory Coast. So there is a unique flavor here, and I'm sure Charles will help to bring that out uh, in some of the work that he's doing right now. But it is a unique place. Um, we have smaller volumes, definitely, but um, once everything comes together uh, and it is produced, I think it is quite unique. So um, to those out there who are you know, exploring, don't know a lot about Liberia and everything, um, I, I, I would tell them that um, they should definitely come and explore here because I think they'll be pleasantly surprised um, by, what they, by what they find.
now I'm on mute. Um, Joshua, we'll pass it over to you. What, what makes Liberian chocolate special? <laughs> um, as Luke Ragde said, Liberian cocoa is unique. Therefore, Liberian chocolate is unique. Because we buy the cocoa being from right here, Liberia. I mean, the beans are just, uh, they are all big boys. Uh, good beans look very nice. Therefore, if uh, you have a better quality, you will make a very good tasting chocolate bar that tastes very nice and uh, that tastes very good to people. I mean, I've been getting the feedback from most of our customers. Um, they always say, yes, you have a very nice taste of chocolate. So Labrin chocolate is, is very much uh, sweet. It tastes very good because the beans are good. And it is made by Liberian who have not really getting outside of the country to explore new thing. That's a very, I mean, I would say that's a very good thing. Uh, in 2018, was the very first time for my very self to taste chocolate, even though my parents have been growing cocoa for a very long time. I grew up on the cocoa tree. But it was in, the, in 2018 when I was in the university that I produced chocolate bar. Liberian cocoa and I tasted it. And the first time I tasted it, it tasted good. Up to now, it tasted good. So, I mean, when I think of all of these things, I think that Liberian chocolates are very good. And if you take Liberian chocolate bar, you take Liberia and you enjoy Liberia. Enjoy the salt. Definitely. You can taste it in that red of chocolate. <laughs> um, Rachel, I'll pass it to you. What, what makes Liberian cocoa special? Oh, got to make sure you, you're off mute there. There we go. I think we can hear you now. Uh, hello. Um, so, Rachel, what makes Liberian cocoa special? Yeah, Liberian cocoa is special in the sense that we have a better range for it in Liberia. In Liberia cocoa, we don't use chemical. There's a few use chemical. Liberian cocoa is important because we discourage our farmer not to use chemical. So chemical get labor problem, kidney problem. There's other chocolate from other places they use chemical and it cause labor, it cause kidney, uh, 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 kidney, uh, 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 yeah, kidney problem. So for that reason, Liberia cocoa is big and we got clean environment and it will be the best cocoa, I mean, best cocoa to buy because it will not affect you and your family. We have a better base in Liberia. Yes. You might ask any time, what made Liberia Cocoa best? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Hmm. Yeah. Hello? 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 Oh, God. Hello? We're getting you. We're getting you. Yeah. Hello? Are you getting us? Yes. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Did you get the answer good? Did you get answers for us? I think we got I think we got it from Rachel. We can hear you, but uh, I think we got it. That that point about no chemical use is, is a big one um, in Liberia and it, it helps. I know those of you who are working towards organic certification, it makes it a lot, uh, a lot more of a straightforward process to be able to get there. Um, Charles, I'll pass it over to you for the final word. Uh, why, you know, especially as 
someone coming from outside of Liberia, uh, what makes Liberian cocoa mm -hmm. special? Actually, big pressure. <laughs> so actually, what he makes it special is, um, on the contrary, I will reformulate why actually someone should patronize uh, the Liberian origin. And because Liberia is really changing, and the whole country deserves it. It's as unique as a Liberian history, I would say. And uh, if you take the whole of Africa, Liberia has a special history in its creation of state and uh, all the production and... Uh, so it's, it's passionating first, and also all, all the farmers deserve to be supported and to be incentivized by having market of good quality cocoa. So despite all the good arguments on varieties, a special landscape, all the dynamic and energy, I would say that the whole country needs the support of uh, clients at the market and to understand that in Liberia, there is a new move and it has to be uh, supported. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, a lot of That's a lot of reasons awesome. to look to Liberia. Um, so this, it feels like the beginning of a lot of a bigger conversation. Uh, we've sort of, I don't know if you can even say you've scratched the surface, um, but we've we've started the conversation here um, on Liberian cocoa and especially on you know driving for premium and sustainable markets. Um, I know that all of us would like to continue the conversation. I think we'll share everyone's contact information. Um, Christy, we'll, we'll look, uh, I'm sure that ACCE will share that around and we'll be participating in the rest of, of uh, the expo as well to continue the conversation. Um, I'm not sure if you guys want to briefly share where you can be contacted at for GROW. We would invite you to Take a look at our website, growliberia.com, for you know research and engaging directly with us, as well as your you know basic your socials, Facebook, Insta, um, and LinkedIn, that kind of thing. Um, Lou, where can we find you? Um, would you want me to give my uh, my email? Would that work or? Sure, yeah. It, maybe you want to say it quickly and then uh, we'll put it well, in the in the notes. WhatsApp, maybe? We'll, we can put it on the screen also. Yeah. We'll put it on the screen. Sure, it's... Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for more information about Liberia Cocoa Corporation and what we do, um, you can reach us at uh, lou underscore Tolbert at yahoo.com. Um, and for direct inquiries uh, mm -hmm. on our WhatsApp number, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, plus 231-770-931-324. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Rachel, where, where can we can contact you, you at? Is a bit of a time like that. Rachel, are you getting me? Yeah, I'm getting you. Um, do you want to share Monley's email address if uh, folks want to contact you? Yeah. Yeah. I want to share it. Or well, we can put it up on the screen. How about that? We'll do that. Um, Joshua, where where is the best place to contact you? Is it via email? Yeah, yeah. You can contact me on my email, uh, rademirrb at gmail dot com, or on my WhatsApp plus two three one seven seven zero twenty ninety thirty nine. Perfect. Thank you. And Charles, what's the best way to contact Sobe Green? through LinkedIn, uh, social media, or emails. So I can share with you later and we can put on the screen if you want. Perfect. Okay, I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for taking the time out of your day and to the audience for tuning in. Uh, like I said, I hope we can continue the conversation. And thank you to Christy and the ACCE for uh, inviting us to participate um, and setting this all up. 
Thank, thank you. you. All right. Yeah. I'd like to just add my own thanks to all of you for taking the time today. You know, geographically, we are not far away from each other. I'm here in Accra, you're all in, in Liberia. We're all in the same industry. And yet, um, as Amelia said, this feels like the beginning of, of a conversation that will go on. Um, we haven't had the chance to connect before. And despite the fact of being in the same industry and, and, and not too far away from each other, um, this, this just goes to show how many connections we, we have yet to make within West Africa and, and beyond. So as we said, we'll be sharing contact information um, for all of these companies on your screen. So uh, viewers, if you stay tuned for a moment, you'll, you'll see how to get in touch with all of these fantastic companies and really looking forward to the connections that will be made. So again, really very grateful for, for all of your time and for sharing um, so much of what's going on in Liberian cocoa and chocolate. I learned a great deal and I know that um, there's, there's a lot more yet to be learned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kobina. Um, so welcome back to African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo 2021. I'm here with several members of our um, Liberia panel, and I hope you were able to tune into that panel. And now we're doing a bit of turning the tables and having our panelists and moderator from Liberia uh, charting the course of Liberia's Cocoa Future panel uh, get to ask questions of the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo. So I, I, I leave it to you. Take it away. Thank you, Christy. Uh, this is uh, Lou Tolbert from Liberia Cocoa Corporation. Um, this is my first time par participating in the ACCE, so I'm not too familiar uh, with the types of participants that you usually get. Um, on this on this platform. So my question is, um, if you could provide a bit of a cross section of the type of participants who actually come to the ACCE, uh, I would have a better idea of how to, uh, to uh, approach that. Yeah, absolutely. So we have, this is our second event, um, the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo, uh, began with its first event in 2019. And so the audience that attended, that was an in-person event, um, the audience that attended here with us in Accra were um, three different categories, I think, that I, that I personally saw. You know, one was professionals already working in cocoa and chocolate. So as you know, we have a vibrant cocoa industry here in Ghana. We also have quite a bit of value addition all the way to chocolate and chocolate confectionery. And so many of our participants were people who already had professional roles within the industry. And that you know could have been many different forms. Um, maybe they were chocolate makers, maybe they were working on a uh, quality side, they might've been trading cocoa uh, and, and you know into supply chains, both within Ghana or abroad. Then we had a group that was um, a little bit of a surprise to me, but, but it probably shouldn't have been, which was we also had a group of um, attendees who were like aspirational in the industry. So people who were not yet working in cocoa or chocolate, or maybe they were just starting out, but we're really looking to develop a business in this industry in one way or another. And so that was really exciting because over the past two years, since that first event, I've really seen a lot of those connections grow over time. And so people who may have attended in 2019, who were either just starting out or were in early stages of their business, they have taken the connections that they made at ACCE 2019 and use them to develop their businesses um, in really exciting ways. And so that's one of the things I'm really hoping will come of your panel and you know, the others that we have, um, particularly those with participants outside of Ghana, is that we can, we can help to establish connections with those who are maybe new to the industry or looking to expand. And then finally, we had a, we had a lot of participation from um, the NGOs 
who are very active in, in COCO here, and they will provide um, organizational or governance type trainings. They often provide agricultural extension services or related community development services within the cocoa growing communities. And so we did have a, a, a large number of participants, audience and speakers who were part of the NGO world. So it was really uh, three different groups and hoping to see more of that again on our mostly virtual event in 2021. Thank you very much. That's, that summarizes it quite well. Um, I have another question, but I'll let my other fellow panelists go and then I'll, I will circle back to it. Charles or, or Amelia? Actually, I'm sorry, I, I, not, <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm interested by the, by the event, but I know a bit, uh, a bit the, the, the event, so I'm okay. Were you able to attend in 2019? No. no okay. No. I will, I will. <laughs> We're glad to have you here now. Um, one thing that is on my mind and our minds, you know, in thinking about uh, these trends and the markets towards sustainability, it's not, it's not, uh, we talk a lot about premium markets and certified markets, but um, the, the main street market we know is changing as well. Um, these ISCO regulations in the EU and in the US regulations are changing to demand more sustainability in supply chains. Um, just to pick your brain a bit on that, how do, you, how do you guys think about that, especially coming from Ghana, which is, you know, so massive on the mainstream markets? How do you guys, uh, are you thinking about that? How, uh, what do you see there? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Amelia. Thank you. I think, you know, I don't maybe it will come as a surprise, maybe not um, to audience members and viewers that, you know, most certified cocoa in the world when it comes to the, the trade justice labels or the ethical trade labels. So, for example, fair trade or um, um, IMO Fair for Life, Rainforest Alliance Oots, most of those kind of certified uh, cocoa beans come from West Africa. And so, you know, between Ghana and Ivory Coast, we're, we're far and away the leading producer region when it comes to certified cocoa. And so I would say, on the one hand, there has been a lot of um, momentum. There's already a lot of momentum when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to uh, governance, when it comes to transparency and traceability, there's a lot happening here for a long time in, in that area, because as you rightly point out, Amelia, there's a lot of consumer demand for it and it's only growing. Where there is room to grow still here in Ghana, particularly, is on organic. Um, so there's the most certified cocoa coming from West Africa for all of those other labels and certifications that I mentioned. But organic is the opposite. And so organic, very little organic cocoa comes from, um, from the West African region, which as we know is the largest producing region in the world. And so most of the organic cocoa is coming from Dominican Republic, from Ecuador, from places in, in Caribbean and, and Central and South America. So I think what I've noticed in recent years here is a, a shift to some attention to organic and, and growth in that part of the market um, and in the on the supply side, a lot more interest and a lot more energy and effort and resources going to moving certainly Ghana um, towards greater organic production. So I think they all come part of a similar package, you know, of of transparency and traceability and sustainability but in a little bit of a new direction here. Yeah, for sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, Lou, did we wanna circle back to your question here? We may be frozen. Looks like Lou, Lou froze, <laughs> but he'll, he'll come back to us. Yeah, it's really it's it's really nice to be able to have a, a conversation um, with with all of you outside of the the panel format. So really, yeah, for sure. Chris, regarding the, the organic, I think uh, with the new 
consents from the EU or USA, uh, imposing a new way to produce towards organic, maybe. Yeah. I think you have to be innovative <laughs> to find a way um, to convert, to support the, transi the transition of uh, conversional to organic cocoa. Even though it's certified not organic, mm -hmm. and uh, definitely the farmers won't move to organic purely if there is no support or incentives. So I think here on the table is a big, big topic to discuss. It's, it's, it's huge. And, and the, the incentive question is a really big one because, you know, uh, you know, as Rachel was talking about before, there's, there's a lot of farmers in Ghana, certainly who don't apply chemicals um, to their crops because they can't access them or they, they can't afford them. But there, there are also many who do. And, you know, for some years, we've also had a national spraying program where um, certain chemicals were, were provided to farmers. And so there is, it's really mixed when it comes to whether chemicals are, are applied or not. Um, but of course, they do help improve yields, you know, especially in the short term. And so, so how do you incentivize or motivate farmers to, um, to use organic methods, which may not immediately show the kind of yield increases or production increases that you would see when you were to apply um, a pesticide or a fertilizer, for example. So I think that is a real question. And I think that um, that's a, a, a big issue because I think the, the desire is there to move to organic, the health benefits are widely recognized among farmers themselves here, you know, among other actors in the industry. Um, everyone understands the positive environmental benefits and the human health benefits. But at the same time, we have to wrestle with the fact that um, farmers may need some kind of compensation during the transition time or um, may need some sort of incentive to, to, to move in that direction, even if they're already on board um, with, with the health benefits of it. We, we yes. need to remember the financial part as well. Yes, and actually on that, I have two points. One, actually, Liberia, instead of to look at Ivory Coast and Ghana, they should look, should look at more Sierra Leone, which is now purely organic. I think it's a good inspiration. And the second one, and it was business-driven, market-driven. I think it's after it has been uh, regularized by the government, but uh, it has been private sector-driven at the beginning. And the second one is um, while we try to find incentives for farmers, to go for organic, we need to have also the inputs, the organic inputs, not too expensive. Because a lot of companies are taking advantage of the premium for organic to make high inputs, but it shouldn't be the case. Yeah, the premium should, shouldn't need to be spent on doing the organic practice, right? The premium should be going back into the, into the pockets of the farmers who are doing that, that, that hard work. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, it's really heartening to hear your comments about Sierra Leone um, and its, its success on the organic front. That's something that I hadn't fully appreciated. And I'm really glad to hear you say that. And I think it's another example of, you know, West African learnings, um, the need to, to increase our connectivity and our, our learning exchange. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think Maybe I'm back. That Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Christy, well, just a question for you. Um, a simple question. Uh, what made you get into cocoa? You spent so much time in this. Well, what was the allure to cocoa for you? <laughs> well, you know, as a, as a, a lifelong um, devoted chocolate lover, uh, that was a strong motivation at the beginning, I think. Um, and, you know, when I made the discovery as a graduate student, which is when I started studying cocoa and chocolate as a scholar, I mean, I had a lot of personal enjoyment um, okay. of, of the product. But when I when I made the discovery that I I could study it, um, thanks to my my doctoral committee chair at the time, um, I I realized that the things that I want to know about people about how societies work, about how cultures and politics and economics work, like all of this really, really big interconnected stuff. Um, you know, the things I wanted to know about those big issue questions, I could learn the answers by studying this food. Um, you know, I feel like 
cocoa and chocolate are a window into, for me, you know, economic exchange, how markets work, you know, how people interact within their households, you know, cultural shifts over time. I mean, all of this stuff I've learned by taking cocoa and chocolate as the thing that I, that I study. And so for me, it's been, it was really eye opening. Um, when I was growing up, you know, even when I was first starting graduate school, you didn't study food, you know, it wasn't something that people um, chose as, as a, a topic that you could pursue intellectually. Now we have a lot of that, but um, it was a revelation when I, I realized I could answer some kind of fundamental questions by, by studying cocoa and chocolate. And to be really, really honest, Lou, I never get bored. You know, there's just <laughs> always something to learn. Like today I've learned so much, um, you know, listening to, to all of you speak. And, and it's a great example of, you know, just the, the endless opportunity to learn with cocoa and chocolate. No, that's great. That's great. How did you, Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for asking. And and how did you get started in it? How what was your own um, motivation to to start your company? Well, it was by circumstance, sort of. Um, we we were working on a project uh, called the Millennium Villages, and we were looking for different ways uh, which communities could earn an income through agriculture. It was a cross cutting thing, so there was agriculture, health, education, but for 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 agriculture, um, I sort of re researched what we had done in Liberia, and I understood that Liberia had a vibrant cocoa sector um, back in the day, you know, 60s, 70s, um, doing very, very well um, prior to the war. So um, through my research, I said, well, this makes sense. I could probably help more people doing this than I am through my uh, UNDP job. So I decided to uh, go into cocoa, start the plantation, and um, everything else is history. But yes, that was my motivation. But we've been, you know, 11 years now, and um, we want to add the next level um, to the value addition, which is chocolate. So um, hopefully by the end of this year, that will happen too. And then who knows what happens next? But that's how we started. You know, I think I think it's it's not it's not uncommon to have these kind of stories where you where you see where cocoa and chocolate can take you, and you know, it, it, in your case, the impact that you could have, you know, could be exponentially yep. um, increased by working in this industry. Absolutely. I mean, our farm we pay direct to the local community, so that money goes directly into the local community sure. in that area. Um, we hire people, we provide jobs, we have training, uh, we even provide, you know, minor medical services to people in the communities where we work. Um, we built a school, um, a primary school in the area already. And um, so, you know, it, it, we, we see a lot of benefits, um, not just the income generating aspect, but there's so much social good that you can do. Um, within the communities that you work with. So um, it's, 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 it's an, a fascinating fruit, and uh, we're very, very happy to be working in it. And we, well, we look forward to working for some time. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have no, no, no qualms about uh, leaving this industry anytime soon. You know, and, and, I, and I love what you said, because it really, you know, it shows that, I mean, cocoa is not just this thing that's, traded, you know, in isolation of people's lives, you know, and I love what you described, the kind of impact work that you've done, you know, building schools, building, you know, really contributing to the, the, the everyday life of people, because that's what cocoa trading is, you know, it doesn't happen over there, and the rest of life happens over here, it's, it's all sure. integrated. And so it just gives us these opportunities to, 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 to do impactful work. Yeah, it's great to hear thank about you. what you've been doing. Yeah, no, thank you yeah. for, for taking on the taking on the task. Really, really, really nice to talk to all of you. Um, I'll just ask if anyone else has any questions before before we we wrap it up this this fun 
um, <laughs> turning the tables outside the panel kind of format. Um, this is really good. We should do this more often. Anything else that anyone wants to, to ask or chat about? I wonder if Rachel, you had a question there. I know you were you were curious about uh, speaking with Christy and and uh, through the ACCE. Or maybe not. I think they're they're coming off of me. We've got the whole Monlay team here. The business See? manager, the gender advisor, and the CEO. <laughs> Hello. There you go. Hi. Yeah, the, we have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Some business manager wants to ask Chris. Can he can he speak? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is Kona. Imanda Kona is my name. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, all along, we talk about uh, organic cocoa, mm -hmm. production of organic cocoa. But as a farmers in Liberia, we are trying our utmost to do these things here. But uh, what would it be, you know, for us to have this, this farmer's dream whenever mm -hmm. it comes to this organic farmer? What are the impacts, you know, we you tell us at least to acknowledge them? Mm -hmm. To transition to organic. Mm -hmm. To make the transition to organic. Yeah, because of most of the Ghana has been producing organic, right? But uh, like as for us, we are chemical free, we produce cocoa as chemical free. Yeah, I I hear you, and you know I think the yeah, the best can the best produce food as chemical free. Actually, you know, it to be like the, the hello hello. Yeah, I I we can hear you. Yeah. So uh, as for us now, mm. it, it really for we to survive on that. I mean that production. Mm. We should make our farmers to produce more quality. Mm. That's why I'm trying to ask you. What's the procedure? Because we always, you know, talk uh, organic, organic, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think there's benefits to doing organic, and there's benefits to doing like higher quality, and they're in a way different benefits, but the same. So at the end of the day, what you need is to get the kind of certification or the kind of relationships with buyers that will bring premium money into your supply chain, you know? And, and I think that's really what it comes down to. And I think you have two options there. You know, certifying organic is something that would, I'm guessing, you know, and Charles or Lou would be better placed to answer this question than me, you know, with an in your internal certifying body, you know, there's the, the, the certification organization within Liberia um, that can give you the organic designation is who you need to talk to. But then from there, what you really want is the organic premium because it's different work, you know, and to get compensated for that work is yeah. really, really important. You know, and then the other, the other uh, thing though, that's in it. yeah. I mean, when you when you improve the quality of the cocoa, what you do is open the doors to different kind of buyers, right? And so different buyers have different needs and some of them want very specific quality elements. And so in my experience, I, d I haven't worked too much on the trading side, but I worked a little bit um, on the trading side. And what I've learned that is buyers have desires for qualities of cocoa that, you know, we can't always anticipate. And so it's really a matter of, of asking and being willing to 
fulfill those needs. You know, if someone comes and says, okay, we're really interested in your cocoa, but we want it organized in your warehouse in this very specific way. And we want sampling to happen in this very specific way. You know, they're asking you that because that's part of their own quality assurance. And the hope is that they're willing to pay for that. Um, so I think it's about also listening to buyers and, and understanding what it is they want, even if it's like, sounds weird or <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's, it's, it makes sense to them, you know, and, and they're asking for a reason. Nobody asks you to do anything for, for no good reason. Um, so to, to be really open-minded when it comes to buyers and the kind of quality assurances they need. That's something interesting that we've learned as well in dealing a little bit with buyers is that, you know, if you talk about premium, you know, we think about it as anything beyond that conventional world price, right? And there are different buyers are willing to pay different kinds of premium. I think maybe in the past we thought, okay, you have to get a certification and then you get a premium. And that's true. However, there are different kinds of premiums that are paid. For example, if you can demonstrate traceability, some buyers are willing to pay for that. And that sort of, you know, engagement with a whole host of different buyers, asking them, what do you need? What are you willing to pay for? What can, you know, what's my uh, capacity to deliver that to you? That's really key, I think, for all of these businesses to think about, not only in Liberia, but, uh, yeah. you know, across yeah. the world, basically. And, and to be honest about what your capacity is. You know, and if it's not, if it's not a demand you can meet right now, you know, then you have, you know, the best thing to do is to say, I, I can't do it now, but tell me what, you know, where I need to go so that I can meet that demand next season, two seasons from now, you know, whenever it may be, that's how we, that's how we build capacity. Yeah. A journey with a more longer uh, business relation, longer term business relationship, right? Definitely. I really appreciate that question very much. I just want to say to Rachel and your team, you have been absolute superstars with your technology today. I know that it's been it's been challenging and you've done a brilliant job. So really <laughs> grateful for you to you for, for for wrestling with the technology as you have and dialing back in whenever you needed to. So thank you very much for, for taking on the, this technology task today. I appreciate it. Yeah, no small feat from Seclopier. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, well, Grace. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I think we'll we'll say our, our farewells for now. And really, um, I, I really feel it won't be too long until our paths cross again because it's been, um, you know, as Amelia said earlier, just the start the start of a new conversation. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Christy, for taking the time and letting us uh, shoot the, all these questions at you. Thank it's you. a it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. so much, everyone. Bye bye. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. All too soon, four exciting days. Wow. The African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo Ace 2021. A very revealing, interesting information, exciting stuff. We thank our sponsors, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, supported by Cocoa Board, the New York Cocoa Foundation, Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Intratourism Africa, who are actually having an event from the 28th to the 30th, which climaxes in the Insa Cocoa Festival. Adorem, Mohini Coco, uh, that's My Coco Limited, Fair Freak Limited, also participants at the Coco Festival, Adorem Asamankese, Asase FM Radio, our media partners, the Ghana Tourism Authority, the African Coco Marketing Center, Hunan, China, Miss Heritage Global, they are having an event in October in Abuja, Nigeria. The Echo Chocolate Show, our wonderful partners from Nigeria, the CIG, the Cocopreneurs Institute of Ghana, Coco Post, 
the uh, alliance, sorry, the International Trade Center in Geneva, Switzerland, and EPAC, a new packaging company in Ghana. Thank you very much for all the support for the second ACE 2021, and we we'll look forward to much more interaction and participation right throughout the year in terms of activities that will come up but definitely look forward to ACE 2022. Thank you very much and bye bye. Welcome to Thea. My name is Lana. I am uh, the co-owner of uh, this coffee house. Um, I uh, grew up in Ghana in the 80s and uh, this was uh, something that I always uh, hoped for, wished for, um, to open something that would showcase all that Ghana has to offer. We're always exploring new recipes and uh, we recently created an Oreo cheesecake um, that incorporates Ghanaian cocoa and Ghanaian chocolate. So there's always a creative aspect to what we do. The most important thing is to showcase the chocolate. So we use uh, cocoa and uh, Ghanaian chocolate in our cakes, in our drinks. We have uh, cacao husk tea. Uh, we even make our chocolate syrup from local chocolate spread. Uh, we have several cakes. We make a really good chocolate orange cake, which mixes a Ghanaian uh, chocolate, cocoa, and local oranges. Uh, we make a very nice latte cake, which also incorporates a Ghanaian chocolate and Ghanaian coffee, Ghanaian coffee beans. Uh, and so we have, we, we use chocolate in a variety of things on our menu, but it's always showcased at the front of everything that we do. It's at the forefront of everything that we do. Welcome, my name is Shiba Iwadako and I'm the founder of Cayenne Skin Science and Wellness Spa as well. And um, Cayenne Skin Science is, is why we're here today talking about a skincare range that is based on natural products, mainly plant-based products. And um, it was curated for all skin types. We hope that the benefits of nature, we can harness that and use it to improve our skins. Within the Cayenne Skin Science range, we have seven products. So that's a capsule collection. We have two products that are still in development. And um, the cocoa products uh, that we currently use will be found in our Hydrating Plus Body Lotion and in our mask. The Cayenne Skin Science Face Mask has cocoa as an active ingredient. Um, some of the key benefits of cocoa that we draw on in that facial mask is the fact that cocoa has antioxidant properties. It also is, is a, has vitamins and minerals that are beneficial for the skin. Vitamin E is one of the key vitamins that are found in cocoa powder and the benefit of vitamin E is that it is a key compound in the production of collagen within the skin. Now collagen is responsible for firming and tightening of skin so typically you'll find that as the skin ages the collagen levels decrease and our mask tries to re sort of increase the collagen that is being lost so we find it as a very beneficial anti-aging product not that it will stop the signs of aging but it will slow down the signs the visible signs of aging of the skin and then also another very important benefit of the mask that comes from the cocoa ingredient in it is the fact that it also has um, minerals that are very important for healthy skin. Okay, so the Cayenne Skin Science Hydrating Plus Lotion is, is a product that we believe leaves the skin hydrated longer, feels comfortable on the skin as well in a hot environment and will work wherever you are in this world. So if you're in a temperate environment, it will still keep you moisturized and well hydrated. And if you're in a hot environment, it'll do the job without leaving your skin looking ashy. 
Within the Cayenne Skin Science range, um, we are looking to develop, we're actually in the process of developing a cocoa face mask, which uh, customers can buy um, and use at home. In addition to the rest of the line within the Cayenne Skin Science range, we have a cleanser, a toner, moisturizers. We think that what's missing in the range is a mask. So if someone's using this at home, they can do their own facial at home. And so that product will be drawing on the benefits of what we're using in our spa. So that after a customer has had a spa treatment, they can go home and do mini treatments at home to maintain the benefits of the product. My advice for budding cocoa entrepreneurs is that they should stay the course. Entrepreneurship is tough but rewarding um, and very satisfying and they should build networks around them. They should learn, take opportunities like the ACE Expo and um, build networks around them which will support them to grow and yes they'll make mistakes but they should learn from their mistakes and move forward. Um, that's, that's the best advice I think I can give. You've just got to keep forging ahead and learning from your mistakes, growing and getting better. afternoon good evening friends chocolate lovers cocoa enthusiasts from all over the world thanks for tuning in to join in this final session of the african cocoa and chocolate expo 2021 i've been tasked with saying thank you and i know it's a huge task i just pray that our hearts of gratitude would come through in this short message there are many organizations and people to acknowledge and i will try to keep it simple Firstly, I'd like to thank the Almighty God for giving us this precious commodity cocoa and also the ideal conditions in which it can grow and thrive. We are grateful to him that he's made it possible for us to witness the second edition of the Expo. A huge thank you to our lead partner, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, led by Dr. Ifwa Asabia Askari. You bought into this vision, you've believed in it and have committed resources and the hand of partnership. We had surmounted huge hurdles to see this year's edition of ACE and a very successful one for that matter. Thank you so much. To our many other partners, significantly our senior partner, Coco Body, our tireless regulator, who stood by us and have also bought into this vision and have made it possible to, for us to maintain and produce premium quality cocoa. We say thank you. We look forward to greater dialogue and stronger ties for the good of this industry. To all our partners, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Ghana Tourism Authority, Intertourism Expo, the National Folklore Board, EPAC Limited, Miss Heritage Global, Solidarity, our friends and brothers, the Coffee Roasters Association of Ghana, the Cocoa Value Addition Artisans Association of Ghana. We say thank you for coming alongside, sharing knowledge and expertise. Indeed, the future of this industry is bright and we will get there in this journey together. To Asasi Radio, our media partners, we are eternally grateful. Design and Technical Institute, one of the key organizations training the future cocopreneurs of Ghana. We say thank you for sharing your experiences, knowledge, and lending support to this event. To all our moderators, speakers, panelists, Russell, and all the other financial institutions who came along. You shared knowledge from your wells of expertise, little by little. All the conversations we have had over the last four days have permanently changed the face of this industry for the better. Thank you so much. To our exhibitors, particularly those from outside Ghana, from Cote d'Ivoire, Spain, the UK, Turkey, St. Lucia, Grenada, China, without you, this expo would not be possible. For everyone who sent their support and well wishes, from all over the world, His Royal Majesty Oba Dokun Thompson, we are grateful for your support 
your advice and everything that you have contributed to make this event a reality. Bill Guyton and the Fine Chocolate Industry Association from the US, the African Cocoa Marketing Center in China, Bill Wong and his team, the International Trade Center in Switzerland. We so, so greatly appreciate your role in this event. To the REACH marketing team, thank you for your creativity, resilience, passion, and excellence. It truly is exemplary, and we say thank you. To our fellow conspirators, the Cocopreneurship Institute of Ghana, Dr. Christy Lizo, the Education Director of ACE, Mutia Morab, thank you for your friendship, knowledge, and unfailing support. To the Ohene Coco team and the Know Your Coco Foundation. Our mission is to teach, inspire, and challenge Ghanaians to know your Coco. You do a sterling job day in and day out. We say thank you. To the farmers who produce this wonderful crop of Coco, we thank you for all your efforts. To everyone who has worked tirelessly behind, behind the scenes to bring this event to life, you have been inspirational. And we say thank you. COVID didn't stop us. We made this through all the challenges. We are grateful to you all. These last few days and Christie's fantastic tasting sessions have shown us that we can still experience the tastes, smells, sounds, and stories of Coco, be they virtual or physical. You have shown us that though Coco is a physical product, its importance and impact is all around us. And we don't have to touch it to experience its magic. We are all expectantly dreaming about ACE 2022 already. We cannot wait. Every single person who has contributed to this, we are so grateful. If I have not mentioned you, do forgive me. We say thank you, God bless you, and have a good afternoon. The lovers of African and Ghanaian chocolates and cocoa products, we want to thank you immensely for being part of ACC 21 that was organized by the Ghana Export Promotion Authority and the Know Your Cocoa Foundation. This year's African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo was under the theme Africa Beyond Beans, raising a new generation of cocoa preneurs for world creation. And under that, we have discussed various topics um, around the value chain of cocoa, from farming to production, to retail, to financing, to the youth's involvement, to women's involvement in cocoa, and how we can add more value for, our, for the benefit of our countries and for the youth especially. And in doing that, we have had great collaboration with the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, who we hope would drive in more investment to support the youth as they go into the tertiary industry of cocoa. We have had great collaboration with the Ghana Tourism Authority. We have um, Ghana Cocoa Board, who have supported us immensely throughout the show. The after secretariat, who has promised us that they are going to be our backbone as we try to drive the cocoa value chain, especially the value addition bed through Africa. We have had great collaboration with some private sector entrepreneurs within the cocoa value chain, like the Cocoa Value Chain Addition Association, um, the Artisans Association, the Fair Afrique um, Limited, and many other great partners. And we trust that as we go into next year, as we add more impetus to the ACCE, you are still going to be there to partner us to drive this industry that we feel um, has not given us what we deserve. The cocoa industry, as we know, is an over 100 billion um, industry. And because we have been exporting our beans to the rest of the world without value addition, we haven't had as much as we should have. And that is the essence of the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo. And we believe as we set this tone, it is, it is going to transcend the generation and the industry game is going to change. The world is going to come to Ghana to add more value to 
to help us to add more value to cocoa and our youth are going to have more benefit than our predecessors we we need your support to ensure that this event is sustained over the years so that we can drive more value addition through the effort of Ghana Export Promotion Authority and the Know Your Cocoa Foundation who has done a very great job with these two events in 2019 and 2021. Thank you so much for your participation. Thanks for your audience and we trust to work with you going forward as far as ACC is concerned. Thank you so much. Congratulations to everyone who took the time to participate in this year's African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo. Hopefully you found it as amazing as I have. The feedback has been good. And so I would like to say thank you to everybody. Hopefully you will register and participate next year as well. Those of you who have benefited from the Expo this year, we look forward to sharing your experience with others so that next year we'll have a bigger global event than we have had this year. It's been a success according to you. On behalf of the organizers, um, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, Know Your Cocoa Foundation, and all, our, all of our other sponsors, we say thank you and we appreciate you for enabling this event. Indeed, it's been a necessary one. The conversations have been interesting and engaging, and we hope that the platform that has been set will be moved to, you know, on a bigger stage so we can actually address industry issues and look at progress and also advance on the achievements that we've made thus far. Thank you so much. And so I formally and officially bring this year's Expo to a close. My name is AC Ahing. Again, it's been a pleasure being with you. Thanks again. And um, until next year, it's bye from Accra, the African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo. Cheers. extend my heartfelt warm welcome to every one of you for joining us today for the opening ceremony of the Made in African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo. ACE for short, I say Akwaba to you all. The first African Cocoa and Chocolate Expo is aimed at showcasing and celebrating achievements and also bringing together industry leaders, emerging businesses and chocolate lovers for knowledge sharing networking, sampling, and appreciating what we have. For this reason, we have selected the most appropriate theme, celebrating innovation, motivating consumption. As you may already be aware, the mandate of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority over the past 50 years has been to facilitate and promote Ghanaian exports through products, and market diversification. It is within this context that we are partnering with the Know Your Cocoa Foundation to organize this maiden edition of the event. Our design now is to make the cocoa experience part of what you get when you come to Ghana. Any tourist who comes to Ghana, whether you come to see the castle or whatever you come for, this morning, uh, my, my ambition is to announce to everyone that we have launched Coco Agro Tours. So what can we do to ensure that our youth take up this cocoa farm? First of all, we need to professionalize the sector and take away the poverty aura around it. And to do that, we need to show the business case of farming. Because the young people here, they belong to the Generation X. Everybody is WhatsApping, Instagramming and everything. They are not like our fathers and mothers. They want to see the business case in everything they do. I'm a person who has a lot training in the training. Currently, we have a lot of people who are training. We have a lot of people who are training. We have a lot of people who are training. We have a lot of people so free extension services. I think so. If I as as I say can say any year then. Yeah, no, so so. Kopo board ma yeh see is no. Omo edi mo ni mo no mo ko ahem phone ne opinion leaders no. Say ni ebe ya ombe mamu as I said ya aye mo fu. And I think so hybrid now kind of 
Kuko bodu so sane o kan no me sense so bi am say say wo kwa speed ya ye to me ma hybrid in free when you come to Ghana uh, uh customs and traditions don't allow women to get access to land but today uh, i can say that what i've listened to uh, going back to my community i can encourage my chiefs and elders to put measures in place for um our fellow um ladies or females to also have access to land because you can see that what men are doing when we give the chance to women to do it they tend to do it better than what the men are doing and whenever you have a product that um, tells people that hey you can get 20 benefits from it it sounds very much like somebody selling the new plant bars you know at the point when i started reading about cuckoo i was like no this can't be true it's there are too many things cuckoo is such that um, you would eat it and will not put on weight. That's the first thing you will have to note about cocoa because of the low calorie content. It also has proteins and has carbohydrates and has a high fiber content. You know, in addition has B vitamins and also has um, quite a number of um, what we call the micronutrients. You know, things that the body needs in very small quantities to enable it to function. So you realize that Ghana produces a lot of cocoa butter and this is exported. It goes out there, then they churn it and turn it into cosmetics and then bring it to us to buy at very expensive prices. So what do we do? We need to promote the local utilization of cocoa butter in Ghana. Like now we are promoting the local consumption of cocoa powder because of its health benefits. We shouldn't forget, whatever is in cocoa powder, we have some in the butter as well. When it comes to cocoa butter in a body lotion, there's a limit to the percentage you can put because you may have separation. Your oil will be sitting at the top. doesn't matter what emulsifiers you add and it is. So there's something in cocoa butter whereby chemically, we can have an ester formation from it. Polythene glycol is a substance uh, that can be reacted with cocoa butter and then we suddenly have what we call PEG cocoa butter. With PEG cocoa butter, now, it doesn't matter what you want to make, you can make your lotion, increase the percentage of cocoa butter, it is still cocoa butter, and it has a thousand other benefits, even in the pharmaceutical industry. We have to start defining things based on our terms. I mean, we have to start calling stuff what we want and what suits us. Because we can't be sitting there and then dancing to somebody else's tune. We're tired of that. So, at this point in time, yeah, if it's 70% something and it's 10% this, we have to decide what we call it. So 57 is an artisanal bean to bar chocolate a manufacturing business here in Accra. We make chocolate from bean to bar. What's very unique about our chocolate is that we fuse it with Ghanaian art and culture. So you can see that some of our chocolate has the Adinkra symbols on them, which is very common and native to Ghana. And then equally our packaging features various places or um, cultural aspects of Ghana as well. Okay, hi, I'm Jabongwaya Delia Carmen. I'm the co-founder and the quality manager of Scoop Choco Togo. So we are the first company in Togo to process cocoa beans in chocolate and other byproducts as chocolate spread, uh, roasted cocoa beans, uh, cocoa past and other products. So chocolate is a company that produces chocolates. And at the moment we have three flavors, main chocolate that we produce. That is the white, the milk and the dark. Yes, that's what we basically produce. And we produce from Ghana, pure Ghana cocoa. We have met our competitors, we are sharing in order to just help produce more for Ghana, not for ourselves only, and not be like we are being selfish, I want to be alone, no, it doesn't work that way. If you say Ghana, we all belong to Ghana. And once I've seen my friends also being competitive, that mimics the work more, I'm a key. But with that competition, we'll be like, oh, I'm alone, so let me do anything anyhow. So far, we are making contacts, meeting new people in and outside Ghana, so it's been a great experience. For um, opportunities, um, I would say we've met 
interested people who want to invest and also uh, people who, who would like to supply us with um, some raw materials. So we are looking at contacting them after the program and finding out if we can do some business together. We are very, very privileged to have an, an actual demonstration of how to make certain simple products from all sections or all aspects of the, the cocoa uh, tree from the leaf to the beans extra Um, well, being at the first African um, uh, cocoa and chocolate expo is, uh, is, is, is wonderful. Uh, I mean, this is the first, but I hope many more to come uh, because it's really a platform for uh, different entrepreneurs, for people working in the sector um, to come together and share knowledge and experience. Uh, I just had a chat with, uh, with somebody here that uh, it's so important actually to uh, share knowledge and, and keep uh, you know, uh, ideas alive and, and, and share experiences because I think in sustainability, uh, is, which is my well, expertise and in the cocoa sector, uh, I think people can be a little bit, um, well, I wouldn't say depressed, but it's, it, it's quite a long process and it's a lot of discussions about how to change and, and these actually uh, activities and these events bring different people together to have that discussion and keep having that discussion. My expectation has been met because I was coming here with the hope to see some new products made from cocoa, which I haven't seen before, and talk with the people who make them. I have seen them, I've talked with these people, so yes, I'm full. And then also discussion. There was an open, sincere discussion with the problems, challenges. So I'm happy, I'm satisfied fully. It is our expectation that the Expo will grow to become a truly African premier and dedicated show for the Cocoa Value Chain, which is able to rival all other Expos in its category globally.